Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host for today, John DeLynn. I am super excited for today's episode. It is June 3rd, 2022. And today I'm so excited to have back as a uh, riding shotgun, as a co-host, the Samantha Shelley. Hey, Sammy. Hi, John. Welcome back. Thank you. Very excited to be here. You'll, uh, you'll recognize Samantha from my original interview with her and Tanner Gilliland, uh, Losing Mormon Millennials. She's also uh, one of the two or three um, main figures in Zelf on the Shelf, which is an amazing YouTube channel. And um, she also does life coaching uh, for people in faith transition and for other types of things. So Samantha, and we, we've had you uh, recently come back, you and Tanner, to kind of do a re- kind of like an update. So, uh, Samantha, you're, you're a important friend to me and to Mormon stories. So is that a good enough an intro? Yeah. Thank you. Anything else you want to add? Brilliant. No. Okay. All right. Well, um, today's episode is near and dear to my heart in kind of a sad, dark, but important, profound way in the, and I'll just give as short of an intro as I can. Um, as I studied psychology, and mental health, got my PhD in clinical and counseling psychology. I studied a lot about uh, good and bad forms of mental health. And um, and today we're going to be talking about Teal Swan or Mary Teal Bosworth, which is her birth name. Teal Swan is a, at this point, world-renowned sort of new age guru, I would say. She's got like 1.5 million followers on YouTube and on Facebook, last I checked. And there's a new Hulu series out called Deep... The Deep Deep End. The Deep End. (laughs) And I I, I knew I was going to forget it again. Um, Called The Deep End. It's three episodes in. I think there's four total episodes. But it uh, it shows um, Teal Swan behind the scenes. Um... When you, when you find out about Teal Swan, usually you're sad, you're depressed, and you're Googling, trying to get support for you know mental health. And oftentimes her niche is sort of providing herself as support for people who are suicidal. And when you stumble upon her stuff and start watching her videos, you'll, you'll get kind of a mishmash of uh, pop culture, new age, secular Buddhism um, kind of stuff. But then there, there's a lot of energy and crystal and chakra kind of talk. And then it kind of graduates the more you get into her into things like um, ritualistic child abuse, recovered memory sort of techniques. And then if you really follow her down the chain, um, some of her most damaging teachings are around um, almost uh, encouraging suicidal ideation and really, really harmful psychological techniques. And I'm not a fan. Um, and it, on Mormon stories, there's two ways that I've tried to explore these sorts of things in the past. One was talking about the satanic ritual abuse panic that, uh, that happened in North America, let's just say in the early eighties and nineties, um, which was where, uh, mental health professionals started using really unethical and unscientific techniques to kind of almost hypnotize people or, uh, lull them into having what are called recovered memories or fake memories as children um, and sort of almost seeding or planting uh, fake memories of abuse that both the patients and the therapists would then treat as real. And uh, this victimized uh, a lot of people, caused a lot of um, innocent people to be accused of really horrific things. And, you know, 10 to 15 years later, the whole satanic ritual abuse panic was kind of universally debunked. It was certainly debunked by the American Psychological Association. Um, recovered memory was was also condemned. And, uh, and there was really never any meaningful evidence ever discovered of actual child satanic ritual abuse. So we've covered that in a few episodes on Mormon Stories Podcast. We'll make sure in the show notes to include links to those episodes. And we also, um, but but then what grew out of that was um, this young girl named uh, Mary Teal Bosworth growing up in Cache Valley as a non-Mormon. She connected with Barbara Snow, which was a Mormon 
therapist that was sort of one of the main therapists behind the satanic ritual abuse uh, panic in Utah, um, particularly, I think, in Utah County, Highland, Alpine area, but, you know, it, it went all over the state. And, and because Teal was exposed to Barbara Snow, Teal sort of imported these techniques into kind of her new age self-help stuff. And, and that's an important part of what Teal Swan is now doing, which in essence is nurturing her clients to create fabricated false childhood memories of abuse, and then to turn around and accuse her family members or loved ones of things that, that likely never happened, then causing alienation from their families, then causing them to be more attached to her and her cult following. So these are the types of techniques uh, that, that we're going to be talking about today. But most importantly, what are we doing today in this episode? Um, Diana Rivera uh, also grew up in Cache Valley. Uh, I have been friends with Diana Rivera before you know, before uh, e either she or I really looked into the satanic ritual abuse stuff, we go, uh, you know, several years back. And it was just through kind of our ongoing connections where Diana reached out to me and let me know that Teal, her former friend, Mary Teal Bosworth, had assumed a new name called Teal Swan and was now gaining a large following. And I think when you first reached out to me, she had maybe 100,000 followers or a little bit more. I mean, I was relieved you hadn't even heard of her. So I was yeah. like, okay, maybe this isn't a big deal, but I don't recall how many she had at the time. I don't think she had hit mainstream media at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we kind of caught it, um, you know, relatively early on, but Teal has just skyrocketed in popularity since then. I did also have on Mormon Stories one of Teal's, what, five ex-husbands? Um, he was just a boyfriend. It wasn't made legal, maybe okay. spiritually legal. But spiritually husband. Legal, anyway, legal. Jared Dobson, right? Yes. Was his name. And and we'll, uh, we'll also make sure and share that in the show notes. But the reason why we're doing today's episode is because Diana Rivera grew up with Mary Teal Bosworth or Teal Swan, and they were childhood and teenage friends. And um, because of Diana's uh, experiences with Teal, Diana feels like number one, Teal isn't, her story isn't um, accurate or honest, kind of her founding story of, of what she tells people. It was her childhood and her background, and we'll get into that, including the claims of really horrific ritualistic uh, child abuse that are frankly just completely unbelievable. Um, but we'll get to that. But but also Diana feels like uh, Teal has hurt way too many people, including, um, and that's one of the biggest criticisms of Teal is that her work has led to deaths by suicide, multiple deaths by suicide. And that's covered in the series. It's also been covered on another um, Canadian podcast yeah, and there was called a The Gateway, I think it's called. Go ahead. Yeah, and there was a BBC um, episode that went over the suicide catalyst claims about her. But yes, also The Gateway by Gizmodo podcast Yeah, covered it extensively. And we'll include show notes to well, links to all that as well. But that's that's I, I, that was a long intro. But like <laughs> saddle up for a long form, in-depth, personal powerful, moving Mormon Stories episode with Diana and Sam. And we're going to be talking about modern day cults. We know about Jim Jones. We know about David Koresh. We know about, um, you know, Keith Ranieri and L. Ron Hubbard. And they're all kind of mostly things of the past. But there are cults alive and well today. And Teal Swan is absolutely leading one. Um, and she's doing it here in Utah primarily yep. and in Costa Rica. So Diana, um, I'm sure that I left some stuff off and in your notes, you were beautiful about articulating your intentions for why you wanted to come forward. Cause you're a private person. You're not some public figure, but so there's always risk or fear and anxiety. So take, take over the mic <laughs> and, and share with us. If you want to start with anything you want to correct or add to what I said, and just your intentions for why you wanted to do this today. No, I think you covered it pretty well. I mean, this is such a long story and it's been going on for so long um, that there are so many um, misunderstandings about it. And it's been hard for me to see everything in the media when I know 
the real story. And I just thought someone else would catch it and I would never have to say anything. This is the last thing I ever wanted to do at all. Even when I reached out to you two years ago, I was hoping you could do the podcast, cover it without me being on it and that I could kind of nudge things. But I, I hate how important my experiences was with her. It, it explains, it kind of debunks a lot of her um, claims and kind of explains what she's doing now and how it all started. And sadly, I had a front row seat to it all starting, which I never wanted to be my life story. Don't want to be known for this. But is it also fair to say that you, I mean, every, every one of our teen sort of experiences can be fraught and problematic and you, you, we can never know for sure what the cause of it, what single cause for anything is. But I get the sense that your teenage years were kind of troubled in some ways that can be directly tied to your friendship with, with Teal. Oh, right? 100%. That you've suffered yeah. because of that relationship. No, there's a lot of people um, around me that suffered from the relationship with Teal. I mean, a big thing I wanted to set straight before um, for anything really was how cruel she's been to her parents in the media. And it's just so unjust. So it, that was one of the big points I wanted to make because I knew, um, I mean, I guess I can name her parents, um, Boz and Bobby. They were amazing. They were the best neighbors you could ever have. They were there for me during my struggles. They were always trying to help Teal with hers. Like they were there a hundred percent. They're not at all how she claims to be. So I just wanted to make sure I kind of went to bat for them because no one else has and they're they're getting such a bad reputation and it's not true what they're being accused of so I find it not fair at all. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And and <laughs> and I think we want to help people who are look, looking into her. Maybe we can avoid maybe we can avoid some people falling into her trap and the abuse, you know? And maybe even prevent some, maybe even save some lives. I don't know. I mean, after there was one girl in particular, I heard her story. She was 17. Her name was Mackenzie. And her parents came out and talked about their daughter committing suicide after being on the Teal Tribe website. Um, and it was heartbreaking. I mean, just being a teenage girl myself and almost dying of suicide and then hearing about someone else that actually died and how those families will forever be affected that was kind of when I decided I have to speak out about this. I can't keep staying quiet and just hoping someone else will catch this and make it go away. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's, it's horrible what's gone on, but I mean, just the beginnings of it, it just, I never would have thought this is where it would be at today. Yeah. And just super quickly, Samantha, this is, a topic you feel really passionately about as well. I, when I, when I kind of told you about this, it's not that you were excited, but I mean, you care about this kind <clears> of stuff. Do you want to just talk super briefly about that? Yeah. I mean, um, for those of you who have seen my Mormon stories or Zelf on the shelf, like I joined Mormonism as a vulnerable 17 year old. Um, also battling some of the things that are going to come up in this story, like, you know, eating disorders and, depression, anxiety. Um, so I know the appeal of, um, cults to vulnerable people. Um, yeah. And I mean, there's a world where I could have fallen into a teal swan hole instead of a Mormonism hole, you know, it's just, you don't, you don't really get to choose what cult you fall into, especially as a teenager. I mean, you're just so vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm super glad you're going to be here to help share your perspective and help with this interview. So thanks for being here. Yeah, no, thank you. All right. Well, Diana, <laughs> where does your, and, and it is a Mormon story, by the way, like Diana was kind yes. of at least for a good chunk of her life raised in the Mormon <laughs> church. Now, Teal wasn't, but there may be some connections there, but this is a Mormon <laughs> story. But, you know, the focus is Teal. You can talk about the Mormon church as much as you do or don't want to, but... You know, it, it's certainly it's within a Mormon lens that all this happened. Oh, for sure. No, yeah. I was born and raised um, Mormon and was active in the LDS faith up until, I mean, one of the positives I give towards my relationship with Teal is 
I left Mormonism at a fairly early age because of some of the things I learned. Like her, her parents were very well educated about the church. There was things I had no idea about that they talked to me about very openly. And I really appreciated that where I'm sure some of the other neighbors might have been like, oh no, this family's turning people against it. But I, I learned a lot of things about Mormonism that no one would have told me otherwise. So, so were Teal's parents Mormon at some point? Do you no, know? they weren't. They weren't any specific religion. Okay. So yeah, just they knew about it. Yeah, no, they um, they researched a lot of religions heavily. Um, they explored Buddhism. There was even a Quaker church in Cache Valley that I went to with them, and it was just a great experience being exposed to these other yeah. religions where. I thought I was in the biggest religion in the world. Maybe I was. I'm not sure <laughs> if that's where it's at today. I really don't follow Mormonism heavily anymore. Yeah. And yeah, they just, I really appreciated my time initially with the Bosworths because of how much it expanded my worldview from small little Cache Valley. Yeah. Well, let's back up. So let's talk about whatever from birth to meeting Teal. What background do you think is worth knowing to kind of set set a bit of a stage of your background in preparation for meeting Teal? Um, yeah, so I had fairly normal childhood, fun. I mean, I grew up in North Logan, not far from where you're from. <laughs> um, I loved it. We, My mom was like girls camp leader. My dad was a teacher in the church. Um, I mean, he'll always tell you he wasn't an actual teacher. He just taught philosophy about it. He couldn't ever teach actual doctrine and he's fairly open about that. So I think he's okay with me saying that. Um, and then the big life-changing moment that was kind of the catalyst to me being in a more vulnerable spot when I met Teal was, um, my parents got divorced when I was eight years old and we moved. So I moved to Hyde Park. Um, my mom got remarried fairly quickly, um, to my stepdad who I love amazing man. And he lived next door to the Bosworths. Our driveways were parallel to each other. So if you went out my front door, there was the Bosworths house. And this is Hyde Park? Mm -hmm. So this is north of North Logan, right? Yeah, I mean, right we, were, north. we were on the border, North oh, Logan, Hyde Park. So yeah. depended on the day if I said which city. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and it was horse property kind of? Uh -huh. like so bigger? there was five homes total in our little area. Um, we were the main home that had kids. <laughs> um, my poor stepdad. Never been married. Six girls moved into his house all at once, along with my mom. And six girls. Where were you yeah. in the birth order? I'm daughter number four. Okay. But there's also a five year gap on each side of me. Oh. With the siblings, so I call myself like the only child in the middle, mm -hmm. which is where I had pets that were my close siblings. It's kind of a joke in the family. Um. Yeah. So. Um, I'm trying to think, what else would be relevant to. Mormonism, but yeah, my family was a long line of Mormons. I even had the story of, we had a relative that was a bodyguard to Joseph Smith. And I later found out everyone has that story. <laughs> like when I got my first book of Mormon thing, when I got baptized, it was highlighted in my book of Mormon. You're related to this bodyguard. And wow, isn't that amazing? You have that <laughs> claim to fame. <laughs> but Yeah. Do you remember like life pre-teal, like, happy or sad or, you know, like adventurous or creative or, you know, whatever. I'm oh, not trying to, yeah. I had an idyllic childhood. I had um, an amazing group of friends. We kind of grew up at the time where your parents knew where you were based on where your, barks, your bikes were parked in the neighborhood and just really fun. Like even then I enjoyed my time in the church because that's where all our activities were. Um, that's how all of us friends got together. And I have really fond memories of my time as a child up until the divorce when I was eight years old. I, I have no complaints about then. It was just really, it was really fun. Yeah. Kind of everyone wants to go back to childhood. I'd go back to that time period if I had to. <laughs> right. Okay. So I guess let's talk about your first impressions of meeting Teal and how, how that went. Yeah. So I met Teal as soon as we moved in. They'd been kind of living up there without many children um, being around them. And um, yeah, Teal and I hit it off right at the get-go. We were both massive animal lovers. Um, both had a huge love for horses. And 
we were pretty much inseparable from day one. I think there was even a point where her mom had to let me know, you need to take a break from playing 24-7. And, um, yeah, we were together so much. Were you we the exact playing. same age or a little no, bit? No, so Teal is um, two, three years older than me. So, okay. yeah. Okay. And you were, so you were how old when you met her? I was just barely nine years old. She would have been 11, 12 when okay. I met her. So, so there's a little bit of influence, mm -hmm. age, age privilege there. Yeah, a little bit of an older friend yeah. having more of an influence on a younger friend, but yeah. fairly positive okay. from the beginning. Okay. Um, yeah, we, they were great neighbors. They came down to our house to hang out. We went up to their house. We all had the background of Edith Bowen. We had gone to Edith Bowen as kids. So I, I, because I know what that is, maybe talk a little bit about that. She mentions it in some, one of her YouTube stories mm -hmm. she tells. Yeah. Edith Bowen was, um, like a, a nature school. I mean, I'm trying to think how to describe Edith Bowen. It's kind of a research school yeah. at Utah State University on campus. Yeah. It's connected to So it's like an Utah elementary State. school on campus at USU where they would also do research, but like have the best teachers in Cache Valley mm -hmm. were there, the best run school, like... A lot of parents, you had to you had to be in a lottery to even get in. So literally, it's probably the best elementary school in all of Cache Valley. I, that's how I remember it. No, it really was. And I think Teal had the same experience as me where she didn't go to Edith Bowen all the way. I think she stopped a few grades in. I stopped a few grades in after the divorce. I had to change schools just because of the back and forth. Um, but we had that in common where both of our families were really um, into those more not alternative things, but more um, down to earth things. So my parents built the playhouse at Edith Bowen and were heavily involved in it. So yeah, we had a few things in common with our families despite the different religions. It never felt like a factor that we had different religious beliefs between our two families. Yeah. How, how hard was the divorce and having to move for you? Like, were you scared to have to move into this new house? Um, oh, I was the kid that, took it all on myself, thought it was all my fault, um, really took the guilt of it. And I know as an adult, that wasn't how it was, but at the time it felt like my whole world had ended and just nothing would ever be the same. And I was very depressed, even as an eight year old, I've read through my journals and mm -hmm. I can't believe how depressed I was. I've got an eight year old child now and it's kind of scary. <laughs> how far down the rabbit hole that took me so quickly. But just knowing my personality where I'm a more anxious type already, it definitely took a toll on me. And were you leaving good friends behind and moving or? I, I was still going back and forth. So I had my original friends um, in my dad's neighborhood and then they came visiting my mom's. It was three miles. I could ride my bike back and forth if I wanted to. It was pretty, pretty easy, but no, it was, it was devastating at the time for me, for sure. And I'm, I'm wondering if what you're thinking, Samantha, is that oftentimes people who tend to wield undue influence look for vulnerable people. Yeah, right? and it sounds like Teal was maybe like a relieving force, like to, to make friends with the next door neighbor and click with her. Oh, yeah. She was very understanding about what I was going through. I mean, she was making the odd comments about what I was going through at the time. Um, but like things like, how can you think there's a God that loves you if he's letting this happen to you in your life? And just there was a slow progression of the more negative thoughts that were kind of being put into my mind that had a real impact. And so, yes, I'm grateful she helped me leave the church in that sense. But the way it originally started happening was it was just sad to look back on but it's like telling a little kid Santa doesn't exist like it kind of just made you grow up or start thinking about things that maybe weren't age appropriate or, or oh, just healthy for you I never would have thought about those things because I still was like praying every day like maybe they'll get back together maybe my life will go back to normal and I kind of got out of that once my parents both got remarried but at the time, I was in a very vulnerable spot. Um, and I guess trigger warning, even at that age, I debated like, do I want to keep on living? And 
I mean, just to be at that age and already having those thoughts is so depressing to me. Um, just, it's heartbreaking. At 10 or 11? Um, you're my wondering. journal entry, I was nine years old when I went and read through it about just not wanting to be here anymore. If this is what the world is, and I don't want to be in it. And so I was in that mindset when I met Teal yeah. already. And I don't know if at that time she was necessarily targeting me because I was vulnerable. I think it was just, I was close by. Um, she needed a friend. I needed a friend. Yeah. It, yeah. And you'd been baptized at eight? Yes. Okay. okay. But it, but Mormonism wasn't giving you much comfort. No, I mean, I left it in my teenage years. I had moments where I tried to go back, but no, I left it really early on. I was the only one in my family also that had left it. So still the only yeah. one that's never gone through the temple and things yeah. like that. But it's not uh, the worst thing. Yeah. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. We'll get there. Um, okay, so I'm going to do something I normally do. I'm going to pause your story because I want to ask some questions about Teal's story, and then we'll kind of do a dance back and forth. Perfect. To kind of merge the two. So one of the videos I want to make sure we include in the show notes is this YouTube video where Teal is being interviewed by some Idaho journalist, and she does like a two-hour interview about her story. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I want to do this is because every cult leader has a founding story. And the, and almost always the founding story has to involve, has to be dramatic. It kind of has to claim special powers of some sort. And it has to be kind of shocking enough to make people think that this person's special and I need to follow them, right? And so usually it's like I saw, like with Joseph, it's like I saw God in Jesus. Or, you know, pick your pick your leader Muhammad, you know, they had some, we'll call it a theophany where they saw God or were visited by an angel and hers is very different, but I think of it as quite similar. So forgive me for pausing your story, but I'll just tell you a brief excerpt of what I remember about her story. And you, you two can add if I'm, if I'm missing it, but it's basically something to the effect of, and this is Teal telling the reporter, like when I was four, I started getting ritualistically sexually abused. I, you know, my abuser would bathe me in, in animal blood. My abuser would prostitute me out to 10 men a day at a gas station bathroom. I, I would watch children being thrown on to bonfires. I probably watched at least seven children murders. Like, um, you know, I was part of multiple satanic cults and it was this kind of horse trainer guy who led me into it. And I didn't escape from it until I was 18 after witnessing at least seven children killed and blah, 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 blah. Like it's, I mean, if it were true, it would be like next to like witnessing the Holocaust. It would be, you know, it would be like a world record in like resilience, right? And in, in, in inspiration, you know? And she also will claim that she, from birth, had special powers. She was an oracle. She could see the past. She could see the future. She could read people's minds. She could speak to the dead. And, and part of why these cults kept her captive um, you know, was because they would use, they would harness her special powers for their own good, right? And and then you're like, oh wait a minute, like how? Why did? Where were the parents? You know what I mean? And and she'd be like, well, they would come to Edith Bowen and they would take me out of school for the <laughs> entire day, and that's you know, th- my, my mom thought that I was getting horse lessons, but really I was watching people throw babies on bonfires. Well, she would say that she was pulled out of her room every night at 3 a.m. and was back before sunrise. And this was to go all the way to Idaho to participate in all these cult, crazy cult things. And then she'd be back in time to go to school. No harm, no foul. Looked just fine. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, those would be the world's worst parents if they didn't see this happening. Yeah, There's no way with the way her house was set up too, that it was feasible. Yeah. And Sam, I, I want to throw it to you, but I'm just going to say one thing as a disclaimer, like I have members of my family that have been assaulted and abused and even raped. 
I believe in start by believing. I, there's a huge problem with not believing abuse victims. Oh, there's sure. a huge rape problem. There's a huge abuse problem, especially within Mormonism. So I, I, I have to do my best to always say, yes, all of that. Yes, we need to believe victims and root out abuse and abuse and rape is horrible and it's underreported egregiously um, and it's horrific. All that's real and important. And if you study satanic ritual abuse and recovered memory, you'll know that there's this other huge area of creating fictitious memories about abuse and then having hosts of family members get falsely accused for events that never happened for which there's no evidence that's <coughs> completely unbelievable. So I, we obviously, I think all three of us side on the ladder as it relates to Teal and who knows if some of the former did happen to Teal. Oh, for sure. We, we don't know. Maybe it did, but that's a disclaimer because we do not want anyone to walk away from this saying, don't believe people who claim abuse or rape or that rape doesn't happen or that abuse doesn't happen or even that Teal wasn't raped or abused. We don't know. No, exactly. All we know is like this founding story of her watching children be thrown on bonfires and stabbed and sacrificed and bathed in blood is part of these horrific satanic ritual abuse cults. I'm not buying it. And um, we want to get your perspective on whether that may or may not be realistic because it, she's associated with Barbara Snow, who was at the center of the satanic ritual abuse panic in Utah in the 80s and 90s. And that's what infects the whole story as being dubious to me. So I'm giving my bias away, but I'm also trying to do my job to psychoeducate as a PhD in psychology and as someone who cares about people and mental health and our community. Samantha, you were going to say or ask something. I was just going to ask, according to Teal's account, does she claim that her parents were complicit in this? Like they just kind of looked the other way or does she, or was it like this person just snatched her away from her home repeatedly and they never knew? I'd say it's kind of both. She says they were complicit in the sense that they didn't recognize the signs, that they just weren't understanding what they were seeing. Um, and they wouldn't believe her. Yeah, it was, I mean, they've been really good about not discrediting her. And that was, that was a huge thing I had with trying to come forward. How do you talk about someone that you think is telling a false abuse story without kind of, I mean, not believing a true abuse victim. And that was one of the things I struggled with with talking to the documentary group that I didn't know how to explain without sounding like I was discrediting um, someone's experience. And her, her parents were really trying so hard to help their daughter with whatever was going on. I mean, they had her in therapy and they were there and trying we, to help her through this. Yeah. And we'll, we'll cover that as we go through the timeline a bit as well. Um, my, my answer to your question would just be, she made her, her parents, her enemies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that became part of her modus operandi for her future <laughs> clients. Mm -hmm. It's like she turns almost all of her clients against their parents and turns them into abusers when they often probably weren't, or there's no evidence that they were. But anyway, the reason why I'm asking all that was just to say by age 10, 11, 12 for you and or her, like, and then we can talk about what you saw from then on. Were there any signs or did she ever mention that? Or is there any, is there anything that would, that you could be able to say that would either say that doesn't seem true based on my experience or yeah, there were signs of that. And I saw evidence of burn marks or <laughs> she told me about killing children or whatever, you know? Yeah, no, there was no physical evidence that I ever saw in her. And I was with her fairly intimately um, pretty early on in our childhood, and I never saw any physical signs. I even met the alleged abuser when I was younger. Um, and we can tell that story, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like when you first met when her, I first met her any no. signs of all this trauma? I mean, this would be a traumatized child, right? No, she was a very confident, outgoing child. Um, there, again, nothing physically, even nothing with what she initially said that would have 
stood out to me as something that had happened. Um, she did have bizarre behaviors, but nothing that I think would point to abuse Okay. to the level that she claims. And again, I didn't know anything about this abuse till I was older, the alleged abuse she claims. So I wasn't in my twenties till I heard about all of this and I was baffled by it. So even looking back, I am, I really can't think of anything that would point to her having been heavily abused. So you were her closest friend from the beginning. Is that fair to say? One of her closest friends, closest friend among her closest friends. Yeah. I only know of one other friend she had. Um, and that friend was out of state and only visited periodically. Okay. There, there was no one else around us. Um, I don't believe she had close friends at school. Um, at least I never heard about any of them, but no, there was no one else around <laughs> but me. So, so from that very beginning, she was never like, something bad's happening to me or I'm being harmed or there's these mean no. people or... I mean, she did um, things that were more like concerning around me that looking back, it it gave me pause to be like, is where would you learn these things as a child? And... I kind of figured out that. Let's go there. So start, start talking about your relationship and how (laughs) it became problematic. What, Um, what behavior started emerging? So my first big memory of it is we had a sleepover when I was nine years old, she would have been 12 years old. Um, so we were in the apartment at the bottom of her house and she went up to her parents' alcohol supply and brought down what's called, I think Irish cream, Irish whiskey. I'm not great at the drinking stuff. And I had never tried alcohol. She's like, oh, well, I have, like, I'll have a sip of wine with my parents at dinner, like, but that's normal, um, I guess. And coming from a household with no alcohol, all new, all new things to me. But I didn't want to not seem cool to this new friend that I looked up to. So she was pouring shots of the Irish cream. I tried to drink it, about died the first time. Then she went and took a shot, easy peasy, didn't even phase her. So I took a shot, tried to do it. And we had a few, like I recall feeling a little sick to my stomach, just like the burning, coughing. Um, And the thing that stood out to me at that is she said, you can't tell anyone about this or else they'll never let us play or be together again. So this has to stay secret between us. And some of the more bizarre things started coming out around that time. Um, It just, it gets so crazy. And I didn't ever want to talk about this before because it was so shameful, embarrassing to have been in the situation, to have been scared to kind of talk about parts of it. But there was um, like when she would have been 12 or 13, um, started looking up pretty, pretty disturbing pornography. So I'd never seen any form of pornography at that point. And she goes straight to showing me, um, like, well, I mean, see, I still even hate saying it even now. Um, like S and M porn and so like BDSM bondage, sadomasochism bondage, yeah, kind of the, porn, the kind of more hardcore porn. Oh yeah. So, and I would have been about 10 years old at the time. So it was just Again, didn't want to seem like I wasn't cool, that I was judging her. A lot of just a following, wanting to be as cool as my my friend was. Um, and the reason I mentioned this pornography thing is because I feel like it played um, into some of the things she came up with later on. And there was even the most disturbing one. This is a funny and embarrassing story. Um, she came down to my house and on our computer, we had a better computer than hers. And she's like, you have to see this crazy thing I found and starts pulling up, um, Googling bestiality, mortified. That, that was the one where I was like, I don't think we should do this. Like, this is scary. My mom's going to come home any minute. And lo and behold, my mom starts driving down the driveway. And back in the day, some people might know this pop-ups were a big thing on a computer. Once they started, they wouldn't stop. I panicked, unplugged the computer, and we ran up to her house. Later on, my mom's like, hey, I plugged in her computer. There's a lot of weird things on there. I'm like, weird, I don't know how that got there. (laughs) So 
and she didn't push it, which I think she was very uncomfortable by it too. Um, yeah, that was a mortifying moment. So she was generally like quite hyper fixated on sex, you said? She was very, very hypersexual. And I attributed that to becoming, like coming from a more laid back kind of hippie-esque family. Um, they were very free about bodies, things like that. Like it wasn't unheard of just to, like nudity wasn't a shameful thing. It wasn't something to be um, embarrassed about. And it didn't bother me at their house. Like I didn't know, I didn't see like the parents naked or anything like that. But Teal and I were fairly free with being um, nude together from a young age. Like it, it seemed so normal at the time, looking back in hindsight, which not normal at all. But so when I say I knew Teal intimately, I knew Teal intimately. Um, you also said that she told you she was the Wiccan goddess of sex and believed she had power um, over men. Yeah, there was a lot of... Um, was that in this... We're in the timeline because I don't want to rush it, but I mean, no, if, that, that, if that, that fits... Was, that was early on. She um, loved the Wiccan stuff and I don't recall... I don't, I don't want to do the Wiccan beliefs a disservice by trying to explain them, but... Because it can just be kind of secular, pagan kind of spirituality that loves nature and it doesn't have to be some satanic thing. It can be a good, beautiful, nature-loving thing, right? No. That way? Yep, and she could take anything that had the potential to be beautiful and put a darker turn to it. So her being the Wiccan goddess of sex, teenage, early teenage, she really thought she had power over men, all the boys at school she said had things for her, and she thought it was laughable how she could get them to be so attracted to her. Just really talked about having a power over men and I always was almost envious because I'm like, look at this tall, beautiful girl. Here I am, short. I wasn't a petite person by any means. And it was actually, it was a huge factor in me kind of developing an eating disorder later on, but she really knew how, at least she talked like she knew how to manipulate men from an early age and- Sexually? Sexually, yes. Yeah. And really loved having that power over them. And I mean, these were the things that made me pause when I look back on why would a child that age be so hypersexual with where they grew up and things like that. And I can't say before I met her that nothing had happened. She hadn't been exposed to things like I can't, I can't attest to that by any means. I didn't see any physical signs on her at the time when I met her. There were no scars on her body, anything like that um, that would suggest something like that. Samantha, you you kind of had a, a theory that kind of is in between being part of a satanic sex cult and like lying about everything, right? Well, just when you hear about her being so hypersexual at a young age, I feel like that is often kind of a response to childhood sexual trauma. But obviously, like, there's such a big difference between claiming childhood sexual trauma and saying, I was in a satanic cult that sacrificed infants for 13 years and I watched seven babies die. And, you know, like, those are very <laughs> different. Like, one is, like, beyond reasonable doubt, you know. It's, so going back to your point about believing victims, it's like this is just a totally different ball game that we're talking about. But I do find that interesting that um, even though it seems like her – intensity how extreme she was with things like extended beyond sex like I it's an interesting data point that she was so hypersexual yeah um yeah. But the computer thing you attend she was 13 and I'm, I'm rough roughly. guessing yeah. some of these yeah. ages yeah, because it was such a broad period of time and these things happened multiple times and it's more I can just I'm trying to kind of attest to how young some of these things started um so yeah, there was a lot of those kind of disturbing detail things she would talk about, but there there was no place they could have actually came from. So when I bring up the pornography stuff, it's really some of the bizarre stories she would talk about. They matched up to some of the darker things she was showing me, the disturbing things, and she, you mean, she almost seemed like she was excited 
to see like the shock effect it had on people. I mean, on me, just because I was so disturbed by these things, they scared me. I was like, I can't believe these things happen. She's like, oh, you wouldn't believe how dark the world is outside of here. Like you don't even know what the world is. And how did she know what the world is? We were in a small town. She had parents. We didn't even have cable growing up. So the internet was our access to things. And even that was really sporadic. So it's, that's why, again, I say I can't attest to nothing having happened to her because I, I do suspect there's a high probability of something happening to her when she was younger, just based on how she's acting. But that could also be explained in other ways. But I'm not a psychologist. I, I can't say 100%, but there was nothing I knew of or that she told me early on in her childhood before she knew me. So I guess that's my disclaimer is I have my opinion on it, but I can't yeah. say 100%. Totally. Yeah, and to be fair, regardless of what abuse she did or didn't suffer, like we are, she's a public figure with like a specific founding story that seems not true. And so that's kind of like the focus here, you know, it's kind of irrelevant in a way what she, you know what I mean? Like whether she True. suffered things, maybe more like boring yeah. <laughs> forms of abuse before then. But what is relevant is like, this is the founding story that she's selling people. And, you know, people are really drawn to this idea that she went through such a unique hell and has triumphed over it. Yeah. Hence the focus on like, yeah, I mean, she probably wasn't in a satanic cult for 13 years. Yeah. And I'd say on the flip side, even on the empathetic, compassionate side, even if she's making it all up yeah. and was never abused, this Still could be disturbed. a personality disorder, mm -hmm. right? This could be mental illness that she experienced from a very young age. Yeah, because like, she's not like, choosing to be this like unhinged 13 year old, like kids don't right. have that kind of free will. So yeah. it's like, clearly she's going through something one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's hard to have empathy when the stakes are so high, but I mean, we are all people. We're all we're all humans. So well, even then she thought she had some sort of mental condition and she was really almost proud of it at times. Like we went through um her mom's a school counselor at an alternative high school. They had all the psychology diagnostic books and we read through those trying to figure out what our diagnosis was mm. for fun and what um mm the symptoms would be of certain ones. So, I mean, she really, really was into that stuff. But one of the things when I'm watching the deep end and I'm seeing her mannerisms, her more flat effect when she's talking, all those things were present when she was a child. There wasn't the appropriate emotional response for certain things. When she's talking to me about these horrific things, she's smiling, thinking like, I guess when, as someone that's been a victim of trauma myself, and I've talked with many other people that have been through trauma that there's different ways they go about it. But I guess, I mean, everyone promised, um, processes their trauma differently, but the way she went about it, it felt like she was excited and really, I mean, she really put a lot on me from such a young age. And I felt like she really almost enjoyed that. Um, yeah, will you explain a little bit more about kind of the power dynamic between you two? Again, because there's the age gap, but also it's she's such a strong, confident child. Tall. Yeah, tall. <laughs> Towering over you. And, and before, answer that, but right before you do, the personality disorder or two that just immediately come up for me, one is what's called antisocial personality disorder, which is totally a weird name for how I think about what it means. It means a lack of empathy like not feeling emotionally affected by things that would be troubling or sad to other people. And you, when you think about, I don't know, I'm not trying to say she's like Jeffrey Dahmer, but when you think about people that can do really horrific things and just not even bat an eye, kind of like Dexter on Showtime, like that's one possibility. Of course, there's borderline personality disorder, which is always testing limits of relationships. It can include self-harm real difficulty with emotion regulation. I'm not trying to diagnose her, but I'm just saying, and then there's also narcissistic, which is like, everything's about me. The world revolves around me. 
and there can be multiple diagnoses. That's that's called comorbidity. Um, and then another is histrionic, which is where you like have an overinflated sense for your power or influence or for you know the situation or the events that you're involved in. So it could be any of those candidates. Uh, you know, it, personality. You know, Samantha is asking me about possible diagnoses, or we were talking about it. And those are for personality disorders that immediately jumped to my mind. Now, yeah, you can respond to that, but I don't want to lose Samantha's question. So. Did you? Well, I was going to say that's very relevant. Her parents talked about those same diagnoses when she was a child, along with schizophrenia and mm, yeah, um, schizophrenia. things like that. So those were things that were considered about her when she was young also. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So back to, back to Samantha's question or prompt. Yeah. So like the power dynamic. And yeah. I mean, obviously you drank out of pressure, you know, wanting to be cool Thanks. for her. Um, were there other ways that you felt like she had influence over you and... Yeah, there was um, kind of a manipulation early on where I had other friends before I met her and she didn't want me around. My other friends didn't really want me around anyone else. So I was starting to be isolated um, fairly quickly, which didn't help the mental state I was in at the time. Um, and really, she wanted me around her all the time. And even her mom talked to us about taking breaks from being together because it was becoming such a problem. And really anything that was her hobby became my hobby. I, I started writing English and dressage with her and just really. That's horse riding, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. Um, really, I just started taking on part of her life and becoming a part of it. And I was slowly losing the life I had before um, and connection with the people I had before and just, I mean, sorry. Well, I just have to, I just have to say, remember what you're about to say. But when I think about episode three of deep water mm -hmm. where, where she's like alienating everyone from their family members and she's <laughs> telling people that if, you know, when she tells the one German, um, what's her name? Juliana. Juliana, like, yeah, and Juliana just wants, when they're in Germany, she wants to visit her family. And she's like, no, if you're around me, you can't be a normal person. You can't do normal things, right? Mm -hmm. She wants to cut people off from their families. And then she wants to make her world, everyone's world. The other one is when she, when the investigator is reviewing the contract, the people who join her inner circle have to sign. And, and the investigator's talking about that with her former partner, whatever that guy's name is, the one that eventually I think is going to leave. Like the, the, it's basically just like what Teal wants, Teal gets, Teal's world is your world. At any point you have to stop everything to do what Teal wants. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like that's how she was with you. The one thing from the contract her inner circle has to sign that really stood out was um, you're not allowed to have any personal boundaries that might affect Teal Swan in any way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did that sound familiar yeah, to you? Resonate? It was <laughs> so familiar. And that wasn't just with me. Her whole family was wrapped around her finger and they were in, in fear of upsetting Teal. Like really she, she ran that whole family and that's also, she ran my whole world and mm. she, she really, it was Teal's way or the highway. If she didn't get her way, she was going to act out um, pretty aggressively. Her temper was pretty horrendous. Um, she could go into these huge fits of just kind of extreme crying. Um, and then just, she would accuse her parents of, you don't love me because you're wanting me to clean my room. And I mean, anything that was just normal day life was beneath her from day one. There was quite the superiority complex. And I definitely felt like I was a much less person compared to her. So why would I ever want to fight back with her? Obviously she knows more than me. So I'm just, I'm going to listen to this person that I think knows so much. I'm learning so much from, and I felt that she had my best interest at heart and really wanted to help me at the time. And she was just a pro at taking over someone's lives, her family included just from a very young age. So watching the deep end and seeing what she's doing as an adult, same thing when she was a child. It's, it's almost scary. You would think you would evolve. 
as you get older. And if anything, it's almost like she's stuck in this one, this one place mm. her whole life. Something I found really fascinating from the documentary is, you know, she positions herself as this emotional healer who can help you like resolve your traumas. And I feel like a big part of healing generally is learning how to sort of like regulate your emotions, not be so reactive. <laughs> and she has got yeah. such a temper that yeah. like you just yes. see her, like I, it, it blows my mind that people can look at the way that she is and like believe that she is like the most enlightened, healed person in the world. Cause she's so triggered all the time. And it like, she doesn't hold back on reacting to those triggers. Yeah. And there was that moment I texted you guys the, the quote, it was like, between the fact that her mission is the most important thing on the earth and the fact that she's been through so much trauma and pain, there's no space for anybody else's emotions mm -hmm. or opinions or feelings or thoughts. And so when you live in that environment, and it sounds like that's what her family system was, not necessarily the fault of her parents because families are hard and parenting is hard. So not throwing shade on her parents, but like if you grow up in a system where your thoughts and emotions are really all that matters, and then that world gets built around you. And you learn that you're how able you ever to learn? Why would you ever need to learn emotion regulation? <laughs> mm -hmm. there, you would never need to because that's a, not only was it a bug, it's a feature. If your tantrums are what gets you what you want, that actually reinforces your tantrums. Yes. And your lack of emotional regulation, right? Yeah. And she's clearly, I mean, she has a degree of intelligence, like a high degree of intelligence in certain areas. And she's clearly developed like high levels of cunning and she knows how to manipulate people and it's effective. So yeah, why yeah. change? No, she was very smart from day one. Um, she, I mean, she is very intelligent in certain aspects of her life, but she did know the power over doing certain things. So like for me, I started um, engaging in self-harm at a younger age. I'm trying to, th did you, looking did at my you learn, did she show you that or model that? No. So okay. Part of the stuff when I've talked about Teal is I've had this fear and this guilt that I helped create what she is now, that I had this influence because I was the one that struggled with being suicidal at such a young age. And then I went on to engage in self-harm. Um, oh, without looking at my notes, I was 12 or 13. You can look at your notes. <laughs> I think I recall that one well enough. And, and I recall the first time I engaged in self-harm, I went up to the Bosler's house. I didn't tell anyone in my family and Teal helped me with it. She helped bandage me up and everything. And she had never engaged in self-harm at this point. But when she was talking to me about this, she's like, you know, this is a sign of depression. Um, it's so you, you're probably depressed doing this, which fair I was. And then lo and behold, a few weeks later, Teal starts struggling with self-harm and the, accused um, abuser, I read through one of his interviews and he talked about how Teal saw how distressed my family was when I started engaging in self-harm when they found out. And she really saw how upsetting it was for them. And he really felt like she was kind of harnessing that when she started engaging in self-harm very publicly, her self-harm wasn't hidden in any way where I was in long sleeves, didn't really want anyone to know. School counselor found out from friends. Um, hers was coming downstairs with bloody arms and saying, look what I did, mom and dad. And she really she saw the power and how much that affected people. And that's where I felt so much guilt forever. I'm like, did I teach her this? Did I have that influence? And it's something she still does to this day, according to followers that are close with her. And Jared talked about that in, in my <clears throat> interview with him. Very disturbing cutting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Trigger warning, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this whole... <clears throat> this whole episode, I guess, is trigger warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you're just trying to be a kid, right? And and what's hard is she might be exacerbating your emotional distress, mm -hmm. you know? If she's cutting you off from your friends and you feel inferior and, you know. Telling you she, God doesn't love you. Yeah, and yeah, like, so anyway, I feel sad for you. It, oh, Childhood it's, you. It's pretty heartbreaking to look back on. Like that's been the hard part about kind of trying to write down all my thoughts about this is there's so many emotions that come up with it. It's taken me a long time <coughs> to finally want to talk about, but 
it was self-harm and eating disorders were so misunderstood at that time also. So with her parents being, or her mom being a counselor and them being heavily involved with like psychologists at the time, um, because Teal was a little, I don't, for lack of a better term, a little off from the get-go. So they were involved with therapists trying to figure out her um, kind of personality quirks. Um, Self-harm eating disorders, it was almost always assumed that person had been abused. So that's it's kind of a sad reality of that, that time. But, I mean, it's not the case with all self-harm and eating disorders. It's also so sad that you have had to, like, live with worrying about you influencing her. Because it goes without saying you were a child and did nothing wrong. No, I, I felt, I mean, really up until I talked to John a few years ago, I felt responsible for some of the followers' deaths, the suicides they'd committed, because I thought I was the influence into her suicidal ideation. Um, and I know now that's not the case, but it's still kind of, I still feel it a little bit, even though I know logically that's not how it works, but I still feel that. Um, another thing in your outline that you wrote about around, I think it maybe it started happening before you first cut because you're, um, you ha you mentioned the journal entry from when you were 13 from the first time you cut, but you talked about how when you were going through puberty, she was like hyper fixated on your body changing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And that's one of the harder ones for me to talk about. Like even I'm, I won't give full detail on all of that because I've kind of come to the conclusion that having an older friend, there was a level of, I mean, abuse I experienced from being involved with her with that. But um, yeah, just really, she was delayed in um, going through puberty and things like that. And she was very aware of that, especially where she was the Wiccan goddess of sex mm -hmm. at the time. Um, so she pointed out all the things changing on my my body and things like that. And the one time that stood out to me the most is I was with her um, in the bathtub in her room, which we did all the time because it was, I don't know, it just was a normal thing for some reason. You bathed I get that. together? Yeah. Yeah. And Again, not something I would ever do at my house. I wouldn't want my parents knowing about that at the time. But I mean, from what she described to her family, things were fairly normal like that. It wasn't body body positivity. Yeah, it wasn't sexual yeah. in any way. It was just yeah. a thing. So I didn't even think of it as sexual. But her mom came upstairs and Teal was like, look at what's happened to Diana's body. Like, can you believe this? Why hasn't this happened to my body? I'm three years older. And her mom's like, you know, maybe you guys have grown out of this phase. You probably shouldn't be doing this anymore. And um, Teal's fascination didn't really even stop there. Like she, my sister above me, she was with me. And she's like, have you seen what's happening with Diana? Like, Diana, show her your body, show her your body. Was that and mortifying? So mortifying. Yeah. And again, I'm, I would lived in the house still where you didn't wear a tank top upstairs. You don't have your shoulders out. And then to go up to such a polar opposite that, I mean, it gave me a huge complex. I didn't want to be growing up, um, especially so much quicker than my older friend. And it's actually a huge thing. Girls that go through puberty earlier are higher risk for eating disorders. So mm -hmm. I had a lot of things stacked against me. And lo and behold, um, around fifth grade, I started having issues with bulimia. And it wasn't weight related then. It was, I'm sick. I can't be at school. I'm too... I'm sick. So I'd make myself throw up so I wouldn't have to be in school. And then it kind of transitioned into the weight obsession later on. But initially it was my get out of jail free card. So was that just like a normal, I'm a kid. I don't like school impulse. Well, I mean, they're not like in school part. <laughs> um, yes and no. I mean, I had such severe social anxiety, like later on, if I thought I was going to be late to school, I couldn't go. I couldn't walk in late and be in front of people. Cause then they would all, have the focus on me, um, which is probably why I'm like, one of the focuses on me right now. <laughs> um, I mean, just, yeah, I never wanted the focus on me. And after having Teal so hyper-focused on me and pointing all the things out about me, I never wanted someone to look at me like that again. It was, I was just so mortified with 
my body and the lack of control I had over everything going on. But yeah, it's really sad to look back on. And you mentioned that you and Teal both engaged in like disordered eating behavior. So I, I debate whether Teal had a true eating disorder and I don't want to discount that, but a lot of the stuff, again, she would see the attention I was getting for these things. Um, Bulimia is very, it's very easy to diagnose. You're throwing up, you're bulimic. Um, she started claiming she was struggling with anorexia and that one can take a while to diagnose. It can be written off as a picky eater and things like that. And her um, claims of having an eating disorder started after I was diagnosed with an eating disorder. So I felt like often she was kind of mirroring my life. Um, yeah. Like she's learning at, at this young age that the way that you get attention is by being a victim of something. The bigger the victim story, the bigger yeah. the splash. <laughs> And that's why I say she learned the response people got. People were freaking out. There's these two neighbor girls. Um, they're both engaging in self-harm. They're both um, engaging in eating disorders. What happened to these girls? Why are they doing this? Um, and really, everyone was trying to understand. Like, I think her mom, even when we watched the movie Girl Interrupted with her, which is a very dark movie. Like, even to this day, I can't watch it without feeling horribly triggered. Um, she wanted us to watch that with her to kind of see that kind of see uh, mental illness. Um, and I think she thought we would really relate to it. And I don't know if the idea was it would be inspiring or maybe make us feel not as alone in some of these struggles, but, and Teal and I really had some parallels with that movie. Um, I was the Winona Ryder character and she was the Angelina Jolie character, the one that um, she was a sociopath and Teal loved the parallels between her and Angelina Jolie's character. It wasn't something I would, I would have, I struggled being the Winona Ryder character because I'm like a borderline personality. That's horrible. I don't want a borderline personality and where she kind of, she didn't see some of those things as a negative where I saw them as a negative. She saw it as like a prideful thing. Like sociopaths are one of the more hardcore illnesses. Um, She's like seeing herself in the character. It sounds mm -hmm. like. And kind of taking pride in seeing herself as the character, which stands out to me now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Really quickly, when you were talking about the bathtub stuff, um, well, don't talk about anything you don't want to talk about. No, but sure. was there, I mean, was she, is there anything you want to talk about her being abusive to you? Um, more just the, the fixated on my body. And then there was talk of same-sex relationships where, again, Mormon me, I couldn't imagine being in a same-sex relationship. I even said that to her. And she always said, well, I could. Um, and she really liked me. So I'm not going to go so far to say there was inappropriate touching. That's a pretty serious thing to say, but there was definitely like affection shown towards each other. Um, like, you know, cuddling things like that, but it, there was enough things that happened now and that I've processed in therapy that I feel comfortable saying there was a level of I mean, I still feel like abuse is a strong word for it, but again, therapists try to work with me on saying it. There was a level of abuse with that, even though it was just kids close in age, but the objectifying and constant discussions and wanting to see me um, in my entirety was really, really hard. And it's not something I was comfortable with even then, so I was very much coached into a lot of the things later on, um, the being more free with being nude and things like that. So. I, you shared with me a couple childhood photos. There was, I guess there was a fire in your home. So many of your photos were destroyed, but yeah. you were able to find a couple. Is that right? I found a few and we, yeah, we had two fires. Our house burned down twice in within a year time frame. So yeah. I have very few, oh. um, items from my childhood so that I found even the picture I found kind of cemented between two other burned photos was 
crazy that I have that. That's all I have. Maybe maybe we can show both and you can just describe real, what they are really quick. Is that okay? Yeah, no, for sure. Okay, so here's, um, so the first one, you can't see it. Uh, sorry about that, but but the viewers can see it. I know, is I'm like the looking childhood for it. photo, is the childhood photo. Yeah, the one that? her and I sitting together with the dogs. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Yeah, and there was other people in that photo that I cropped out for their privacy. Um, you're the yeah. you're the blonde haired and she's the brunette. Is yeah, she's right? the brunette holding okay. the two little white dogs. Um, I believe the dogs in that photo are Blanche and Sydney. Okay. Um, and we had baby lambs. We were bottle feeding in that photo. So. Okay. And then the second one is a little more spicy. <laughs> oh, is this the the lingerie in our field with our horse photo? Yeah. 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 Um, what was going on there? I found that one when I went to look up the modeling photos because I don't recall her modeling when we were younger. Um, my parents were mortified when they saw that photo. They're like, when was there a girl in underwear in our yard <laughs> with a horse? And um, her pants are kind of pulled chaps. down. They're chaps? Those are okay, chaps. Okay, because she's in her underwear. Chaps? For those who are not those who are listening, she's in a bra and under black bra, black underwear with chaps. Next to a horse. Yeah, pumpkin or Appaloosa. Um, yeah. Any, I mean, what would have been the context for that? She, so when Teal talks about her modeling days, it was friends taking photos of her, um, which that one I'm pretty sure was a friend. I mean, her parents took some photos of her up at Tony Grove where they were forest rangers. And I mean, to my Mormon mind, they were risque to anyone else. They were normal. They were just photos of her in normal clothes up in Tony Grove. And but the horse one was one of her many trying to shock you photos. Um, yeah, like I said, okay. my parents are still dying over that one. But yeah. um, OK, um, maybe let's make a note to include that in the video cut. Um, uh, Did so she? Sorry. Go ahead. I just didn't want to move on from the modeling. Did she lie about how much modeling she did? Or um, she lied to the kind of extent of what her modeling was. She claimed to have traveled internationally doing runway shows that she was um, scouted outside of a feed store in Cache Valley. Uh, As all top models are. Yeah, <laughs> and the one runway show I went to of hers was Cache Valley Mall. I'm pretty sure it was for Maurice's, and all my neighbors were in it also. And it was just like a hey, you guys available? Come put the clothes on and walk for the back to school clothes. And if you know the Cache Valley Mall. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Yeah, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. They may have a corn dog shop. Maybe. I mean, they might have that. And I think the majority, <laughs> like ZCMI was replaced with like Cal Ranch. So yeah, right. we have a ranch store in our mall. You can go buy a feed for horses at they the have same like time. like a T-Mobile or a, you know. <laughs> I haven't been there in ages. Chocolate store. Anyway. <laughs> Would yeah. you... Would she lie about a lot of things generally like that? Like, did yeah. you always catch her in lies? Exaggerating. So I reached out to some of my friends that were around me at the time, and they had one of the kind of funniest, almost telling memories of her. And the three of us were at my house, and Teal was telling us about some international modeling show she had just done. And <laughs> I was so annoyed with her at the time that I just got up and walked out and went out to our horse barn. And my... Um, other friends sat there talking with Teal and this is Teal's embellishment. She had just done an international runway show and she's like, but when the show's over, what they do is they'll take you in the back room and rub your whole body down with oil. And she's like, and I mean everywhere, your whole body. Naked? Yeah. So my friend's like, what? They would do that? That's not okay. Like, have you told anyone about this? Um, and she's like, Teal just thought it was great. She could see the shock on my face. So my friend went out to find me and I'm in the barn. I'm super annoyed with Teal. This, this is when I was a little bit older. She's like, can you believe this happened to Teal? I can't believe no one's like, should she tell someone about this? And I'm like, and I said to her, I'm like, you know, this is all bullshit, right? This is one of Teal's many made up stories because the, the veil started slipping as we got older. And as I read through my journals, I was a lot more annoyed with her when I was around 14, 15, because you could see how far-fetched all these stories were. And when I started calling her out on it, she would do the, 
I'm not going to be your friend. I'm going to fully pull back. Kind of, I'm going to punish you for calling me out on this. And I'm stubborn. And as I kind of started getting more of a voice, as I got older, I called her out on more of those things. And she was not as happy with me in our friendship. And I think that's kind of why some of the things she later did to me um, happened almost out of spite. And that's one of the, I mean, the craziest part of my story with her is kind of the spiteful thing she did to me after I was kind of taken away from her. Yeah. And I want to go there, but before we yeah. do, uh, let's go back really quickly. You talked about how you were with her so much. It was almost a problem for your parents or for hers or for both? For both. Okay. So, so if, if she's, you know, if we go back to her founding story, if she's in the sex cult where she's, you know, satanic murder, sex, death cult from age four or five until 18, she's constantly, you know, with them sacrificing children, bathing in blood, being prostituted out in, in um, gas station bathrooms to 10 men in a day. Right. Mm -hmm. So would she, if she's with you all the time and it's, she's with you so much that it's a problem for her parents and yours in your mind, would she have had time to moonlight as a, as a member of a child satanic sex murder death cult? I mean, <laughs> while I'm doing the modeling internationally, yeah, like, well, exactly. <laughs> she's in Paris tomorrow. <laughs> Just with the way our homes were set up. I mean, if a car drove down a driveway or near us, all of our parents noticed because there's always speeding cars near our house. Like we, everyone was always on alert. So if she's sneaking out at 3 AM, we have dogs all around us too. We've got farm dogs. They're not, quiet they're gonna freak out on everything I mean it's just it's so improbable and I had sleepovers at her house she was never getting these calls to like magically wake up at 3 a.m and leave <laughs> that never was a thing so it, it just or even weekends I mean no she was at I talked to some of my family members about this and none of them have really followed her this whole story of her abuse stuff didn't come out till I was in my twenties. Till Barbara Snow. Till Barbara right. Snow. Um, what, what, was she all, like one last question about that is like, was she involved in hobbies? Was she doing soccer? Was she doing dance? Was she doing, you know, yeah. was she involved in a lot of other extracurricular activities in addition to being an international model and spending all her time with you that would have made it even harder for her to have time to be moonlighting in a death cult? Yeah, she did ballet at the Whitaker Center. I even went to do ballet at there because she was doing it. thought it was so cool. I couldn't do ballet, lo and behold. Um, so she did dance and then horseback riding. We both took lessons and we're always trying to find little 4-H shows to compete in. There, And then her family was very involved in like their forest ranger stuff. And if she's gone with her parents to the cabin up at Tony Grove for the month or two they were there. They're all together 24 seven with no cable. I think there might've been some basic electricity up there, but it's so improbable with how present her parents were, how present my parents were that this girl could just disappear for massive amounts of time and no one would notice. Including from school, like Edith Bowen wouldn't protest if some random, she she kind of passed it off like, <clears throat> oh, back in those days, you know, Edith Bowen didn't care who checked you out of school. And I'm like, what? Like, Edith no. Bowen would have very much cared if non-parents were pulling kids out of school for entire days. But that was part of her narrative, right? Oh, yeah. And Edith Bowen's a really progressive school. They're keeping close tabs on it's, all their students. It was smaller class sizes. It's on the Utah State University campus. So they're yeah. not going to, they're going to be extra vigilant I mean, about all adults being around these kids, right? And even then, it wasn't just anyone could check you out. That wasn't... <laughs> yeah. I really I mean, feel like we're giving this theory too much credit. <laughs> well... I know we have I mean, to, I know we have to. Yeah, it's, you're right though. That's just so absurd. Yeah, That's the hard part and that's where that's I never... that's her founding story. Yeah. That's where all her power comes from. Yeah. Keep going. No, I, that's why I never thought I'd have to talk about it because the <laughs> police, when she... It was reported to police when she was older... Nothing happened because there was no evidence. There was nothing to go off of. There's no physical evidence on her body of these 
horrific things that had happened to her, yeah. aside from the self-harm she did herself, um, yeah. that she tried to write off as ritual abuse. Right. Yeah. And there was there was nothing to investigate. Okay. Okay. So we're going to say anything else about our extracurricular. Oh, um, how many siblings, how many siblings? Cause like she would have had to been abducted, abducted while other siblings were in the house. Right. Yeah. No, she has, she has one brother and he, I think he's my age or maybe a year younger. Okay. So younger brother, he might be exactly my age. Um, okay. Yeah. Nothing ever was around him. He's never come forward and said anything. He's hid from this whole thing because it's been so destructive to his life. So he's not even a part of it from what I understand. He just avoids it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me if this is the time to introduce this horse trainer guy that she ends up claiming is at least one of the people that was her her main sex death cult inductee. Do you, you met this guy, right? I did. I met him. I won't name him because yeah. I have a thing. I'm not with false accusations. They carry weight to some people and they do damage. Yeah. So I believe she Nick's name, nicknames him in her um, writings as Doc. And Doc was just a large animal vet. I was with him a few times. Nothing to write home about. Found him kind of boring. Um, there was one night her horse had injured its hoof and he came over and her parents were all there. I was there. I think even my mom might have been there watching also. And it was just him explaining proper horse care for their hooves and treating the horse. There was nothing that would be a red flag. Um, and I saw him at their house one other time treating her other horse. But as far as him hanging out there on a regular basis, her leaving with him. And I never saw that. And I, I know she did go with him a few times. And that was, um, according to his report, when some other people reached out to him and talked about it, it was from like the hours of maybe three to five, if that, and it was not often, it was very sporadic. And he claims he had his wife with him whenever those things like that she was with them. What alone. Would, why would her parents have allowed her to be a, with this guy, what, what would they have been doing? Yeah. So they reached out to him after, um, our mental health was spiraling. The self-harm stuff happened, was starting to happen. Um, they were trying to give her some kind of hobbies, kind of get her more involved in, um, horses, animals, because that was her strong suit. She loved animals. So they thought this might be kind of something that can take her mind off things, give her something to focus on, maybe look towards, a future job. Is she going to be a veterinarian? So it was kind of just trying to find something to take her mind off things. And maybe she would learn some things along the way that might help her. And doesn't she say that, um, you know, normally people would balk at kind of her quirks, but when, when she talked to him about like her, what I would describe as like synesthesia, you know, like hearing colors and all that stuff, he didn't think it was weird. And I think she describes it as he was like, I can help you. She described, from what I heard from her, it sounded like he he was claiming to take on like a bit of a bigger mentor role than just like, here's this thing. What's your impression of that? Um, no, because I, I don't see him as being such a big figure in her life as she puts out there. I feel like it was someone that had a few months maybe that he was – maybe like a few months I remember them kind of being more in touch and it was maybe one day a week, every other week, like probably a handful of times that they were together. Um, And I think from what I've read about him, he has some kind of alternative healing practices, some quantum theory style things. And she learned some things about that from him. He also has a book out that kind of talks about those things that the Bosworths had. Um, so she, she learned some things from him, but I won't say she was with him directly to learn all those things. There was also his books he had written. Um, but she wrote him letters later on that have been published online. And to me, if this man was your abuser, why are you writing him these long letters, even embellishing um, in the stories she wrote to him about being in Playboy and things like that? And 
supposedly according to this man when he talked about it, she included naked photos when she sent this to him and he wanted nothing to do with that. Um, was shocked by that also, but she, I mean, she really reached out to him quite a bit when she was older from what the contacts close to her have told me. So I guess I'm saying some of that third hand, but she dedicated her first book to him, didn't she? So the books, I, I have a hard time reading the books. I was scared forever that I would be in them. So I've skimmed the books lightly. I don't look into them heavily. So that's you your memory, me. Sam? That, that she dedicated Yeah, I think the she did. To and it was like a positive, like, you know, dedication. Mm. I don't know when, I don't know, like, the timeline of when she started claiming things. Mm. On the horses, had she, um, prior to meeting with the horse guy, because she loved animals, did she claim, like, supernatural animal powers? Um, or other powers? The other powers... No, she claimed to be unique is what she claimed, that um, she liked different colors than everyone else. She loved telling the story of when I was in kindergarten and they said, what's your favorite color? She's like, and I said brown. <laughs> and she thought that was so special because she's like, brown is actually the most um, in-depth color. It shows that you're such a a myriad of things and just really it's the most special color you can say is your favorite color. Um <laughs> That's anything, a really fun story. That feels anything, like it represents a lot. Anything about her had to just be over the top special. Mm. Um, so no, no special powers that you remember her claiming. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned reincarnation that you guys would talk about reincarnation. There was the special powers that she. Um, I have a hard time calling it special powers, but like things like Ouija boards and things like that, she had at her house and she would say she was in touch with dead people. That was a thing. She also said her home was on a burial ground. That home just got torn down recently. It's not a burial ground. Um, that she could really talk to the dead and things like that. That's special powers. I mean, <laughs> all these dead people, when she talked to them, just wanted to like scare us kind of thing. Like there was always really dark things when she'd be like, Oh, there's a dead person in the room. Um, but she didn't do this around a lot of people. She didn't put this out there that she thought she was seeing dead people. Um, like my little sisters <clears throat> were around her also. And they said she would kind of say these things like there's some dark spirits over my house right now. Like you should probably go inside and things like that. But she didn't talk about this to everyone. No one had heard about these special powers from this kind of quirky little girl. Um, but she talked about being an alien as a child. And I know that's something she really talks about now. That She, she came, was an alien? That she um, was part alien, came from some far out there planet. <laughs> and it's one of those things I just wrote off at the time because... She was telling so many out there stories, like the modeling, international stuff. And I'm like, you've been home all week. You weren't over <laughs> in Europe. So it was around the time I was getting really annoyed with the stories. Mm. But she was hypersensitive to things like loud noises were really distressing for her. Um, textures. She had a hard time with textures and... I mean, there was discussion when she was younger about, is she on the spectrum, kind of? Oh, the autism spectrum? Mm -hmm. Just with kind of like her rote memorization that she was really good at doing. and Oh, yeah, she says she has a photographic memory. Do you think that's true? I don't think it's true. Because no, like people will I, say that. <laughs> I do think she has a very good memory. Um, she was, like I said, she's very smart. She can She can read something and really take a lot from it and she remembers the like the most minute details she can remember easily. So I think that's one of the things that's carried her so far is she is smart in that aspect. I would say she's lacking in some other aspects, but I can't say she's not smart. She is very smart. Well, that, that claim of an ability to talk to the dead plays into the deep water series into some really dark, dark stuff and it also just like for me 
red flag number one of a charlatan is to claim special powers. Mm -hmm. And that becomes one of the special powers she uses now, along with her founding story. She claims to be able to talk to the dead and see the future and see the past and know what's best for people, know what they're thinking. Like, know what happened to them in their past if they yeah. have no memory oh, of it. And yeah, and to be able to channel the consciousness of their past selves or their parents or their prior lives and all that is like, I mean, that's Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow stuff, right? That's. Um, that's Julie Rowe stuff in Mormonism in the prepper movement, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a way to claim power over people. And yeah. so you're saying you, you saw signs of that. Well, the disclaimer with that is the dead that we were talking to were, there was supposedly an Indian burial ground below her house and it was them talking to her. And then the other group that was supposedly talking to her was, she always told me there was two dead children locked in the closet back in her bathroom. It was this, one of those old sealed cupboards from an old house. And she's like, no, they're in there. And they still talk to me, these two dead children. And did you, were you terrified when she would tell you? Oh, I was, like I was so terrified. I, <laughs> did you believe she believed it or did you believe she I, was, I just... believed it at the time oh. and just thought like, I don't want to piss these little kids off. I don't want them <laughs> following me down to my house. There's also the dead wiener dog that lived in her light fixture that was watching you and you had sleepovers at her house and this, oh, that stupid dead dog's alleged dead dog in the <laughs> light picture scared me so bad. She'd be like, no, don't be scared. He just laid down to go to sleep in the light. He's not going to do anything. He's not going to get out of the light. You're safe. It's a benevolent ghost dog. Yes. That's nice. You could think a wiener dog ghost would be like so cute. <laughs> oh, I was terrified <laughs> of him. Um, so let's now, so there's at least two stories I want to make sure we, uh, talk about in your and her adolescence. One is her meeting of Barbara Snow and her own treatment and, and her discovery of satanic ritual abuse and anything you know about that line of her story. Mm -hmm. And then there's a point where that bleeds all over into your life. Th yes. Those are two things I want to make sure and cover. Is there anything else you think we should cover before we go there? Um, like in regards to her special powers, there was the other thing that she tried doing with me. The focusing, if you focus really hard, you can move objects with your mind. I'm sitting there with her, both trying to do it. She's like, my object just moved. Did you see that? No, I didn't see. I was focusing on mine. Now I'm going to watch you. You you show me how you were doing it. Well, it can't move now that you're focusing on me. It was her <laughs> thing. So That's... if I wasn't looking at her, the objects were moving. But <laughs> Joseph Smith. I mean, That's big like Joseph Smith energy. Oh, the 160 pages. This is your fault for looking. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, those delusions of grandeur and her magic powers were something she talked about, weren't there. Again, she called herself the modern day Joseph Smith. What? As a child, that was, for me, I'm like, that's sacrilegious. You can't talk about the, <laughs> the great, wonderful prophet at the time. But what a weird thing to claim, yeah. especially if you have this great disdain for Mormonism. You want to be like the Mormon prophet. Mm. But yeah. I know this is jumping back a tiny bit, but just in case anyone watching doesn't know, she does claim that the um, horse doc introduced her to the quantum realm. And I listened to an interview with him. He does, he did horse acupuncture. Now he says he doesn't need to do the needles because it's all about intention. So it does sound like he has like these spiritual beliefs that she caught on to. So it kind of seems like what she claimed ability wise, kind of, she's like picking up stuff as she goes throughout her life and is adding to it through yeah. these various influences. Yeah. And I was just going to say, thanks for bringing us back to that. Cause I was just going to say, Margie has enough sexual abuse in her family history. We would have never let our 12 or 14 or 16 year old daughter be alone with some guy going to Idaho for hours at a time. So like, we don't know. We don't want to falsely mm -hmm. accuse, but like, I'm just saying we would never do that. That's, no, it's, that's a little bothersome to me that that was allowed, not uh, stopping short of accusing him of doing anything, but see, that's it's the, troubling. The thing is supposedly she wasn't alone with him. His right. wife was also with them. Yeah. And I mean, now in this day and age, I mean, I would never let my children go off with just this healer friend of mine. So it's, it's definitely sketchy, but even for back in the day, there were some parameters 
around that. It wasn't, here's my daughter, free range, bring her back when you're done and we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll go from there. It was, all right, you're going to go here and where you're going to be doing what and be back by when. Yeah. Shoot back by dinner, if not sooner. Cause I hung out with her after school. So it wasn't often. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, whereas um, the impression I got from her story was like her parents just kind of put her in the hands of this guy and he kind of was then this full-time mentor. That's just the impression I got yeah. from listening to her talk about right, it. Right. Yeah, that's classic teal embellishment on something that would have been fairly minor, innocent to her telling of it. Like the one quick example was she claimed she had an ex-husband that dropped her off in the middle of nowhere because he was just sick of her and she had to walk home. I talked to her mom once after she had broken up with the first husband and she's like, yeah, he just didn't know what to do with her. He brought her back home, just said, I can't help her anymore. I hope you guys can figure it out. Brought her home. But her story is I was dropped off in the middle of nowhere, middle of the night, I had to find my way home. Mm -hmm. So it's just classic. Here's what happened. And then there's Teal's telling of what yeah. happened. Yeah. And yeah, flipping to the other side, if, even if um, you know none of this happened with Doc, if you're going to create a founding story, either one that you end up believing or one that's totally fictitious, you're going to root it in in real things that happened to you, with real characters in your life, or things that would be at least semi believable to the people who would have been around you, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, no, so that's even what yeah. made me question: Is there when I found out about these allegations she was making happen around our childhood, there was elements of things that were true. And then they were so mixed into all these crazy things, but those small true elements made me wonder, yeah. which is why around the time I reached out to other therapists and things like that to figure out what did I just get thrown into? Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about before we jump into Barbara Snow territory? I'm drawing a blank, so <laughs> lead the way. This is great. I'm loving it. This is so amazing. Both of you, thank you. Um, okay, so what do you know about her mental health treatment and the whole Barbara Snow stuff? Yeah, so she went to a therapist in Cache Valley. Um, Cache Valley, small town. So we were usually a little outdated on what our treatments were. But this is kind of my my theory mixed with some of my memories of how her meeting with Barbara Snow came to be is because of the things Teal and I were doing, it suggested trauma um, because of the cutting eating disorder, depression. Um, so they started reaching out to therapists that specialized in trauma and her parents, her parents. Yeah. And there was talk of the repressed memories, the recovered memories when we were younger, it was kind of a, maybe things have happened and you guys just don't remember um, until really latched onto that. Um, and so they did see a lot of therapists in Cache Valley. I saw a lot of therapists in Cache Valley. None of mine brought up the repressed memory stuff. So I'm grateful for that, but it was something they were talking about way before her time with Barbara Snow. So my theory is that's why they reached out to Barbara It's her specialty in trauma therapy. So you mentioned your notes and this is where Weirdly, I come into the picture. <laughs> you me you mentioned in your notes that somehow the Utah State University psychology faculty, which is where I got my PhD, <laughs> were somehow involved. Would that have been after Barbara Snow or before? Before. Okay. So yeah, this would have been in the '90s when we're yeah '90s early. I mean, starting to bleed into the 2000s. That it was a common thing in psychology, from what I've come to understand, that the therapists' um, psychology department in Cache Valley. They believed in this satanic ritual abuse stuff. Um, sorry if I'm jumping the gun on bringing that one up. So much that they went looking for where these things could have happened, for the evidence. And Members of the Utah State University Psychology Department. Mm -hmm. And was that in conjunction with Teal or just? Nope. This is just things I've learned yeah. later on from yeah. other people that went to school in that department at the time. Okay. But it was, people really believed these things were happening, but when they went to look, couldn't find any evidence to corroborate. And how did that connect with Teal or did it? Um, yeah, I don't know where it connected with Teal so much early on, other than there was the assumption that there had to have been some form of trauma. And even Teal talked to me about um, how I could have had 
some abuse that was so horrific that I've repressed. And that I think she learned kind of from therapy. So or, maybe she saw therapists at Utah State that yeah, would her, have talked to her about satanic ritual abuse? And her mom was a school counselor yeah. in Cache Valley in the Cache County School District. Okay. Yeah. I I would have think I would have thought that they were looking into those things also because they looked into every treatment under the sun to figure yeah. out what was going on with these spiraling girls. So it yeah. it was a conversation back then. It wasn't heavily focused like it was later on after she met Barbara Snow, but it was something I was aware of was talked about then. Yeah. Well, the reason why I'm bringing this up is not to insert myself in your story, but when, so I started my PhD in psychology at Utah State University in 2009. And one of my super, what one of my supervisors and, or, you know, mentors, faculty member was Carol, Dr. Well, not doctor was Carolyn Barkus. She was this 70 ish year old woman with native, native American ancestry who, um, as one of my professors, taught us all as PhD grad students, 2009, 2010, that satanic ritual abuse was a real thing and that there were murders of children being cut up and, and burned alive or whatever. She taught us this as part of my training. And I had heard a, enough about the Mormon satanic ritual abuse stuff with the PACE memo where I knew that it was not a legitimate thing, but, but you're as a grad student, you're in a position of no power, none. And if you cross a faculty member, you could be screwed immediately, you know? And after all that investment, it wasn't like I was like arguing with her during, you know, the time when she's training about that. But, but here's the other thing. Carolyn Barkas was really into horses and she lived in North, like North of, you know, North Logan, Hyde Park, and had all this horse property and these horse ranches and would have been really involved in horsing. I, I, my, I went with her once on a horseback ride with a bunch of other horse riders. So like, I don't know if there's some connection between Doc and Carolyn Barkas. I have no idea. Or, or even Teal per se. But the other weird thing is Carolyn Barkas helped run a trauma group at Utah State University in the clinic. And I used to, I used to provide therapy in my training next door to this trauma group that was going on. And I would hear people in the trauma group screaming at the top of their lungs in treatment with Carolyn Barkas. And Carolyn Barkas believed in this go back to your childhood as a baby, envision is there a dark person next to you? Sort of like recovered memory techniques. And she believed in satanic ritual abuse. And she was doing this trauma work where she was encouraging childhood recovered memories. And she believed in satanic ritual abuse. So like it all, when you mentioned Teal and then the psychology department, it was an immediate connection for me to Carolyn Barkas, who was really good to me. So I'm not trying to like throw under the bus or allege anything other than just that connection's real, and I personally experienced it. And I have no idea if there's any sort of triangle triage between Teal, Carolyn Barkas, and Barbara Snow, but it would not surprise me if there was some sort of connection, or if even Teal would have seen Carolyn Barkas or, or someone in that department in training. So if anybody ends up watching this <laughs> can fill in any of those blanks or tell me I'm all wet, please do. But like... I believe that that the psychology department at Utah State might have played a role in in Teal's journey. Oh, and the Dark name was journey, the right? name was so familiar when you mentioned it. Um, so I can't one hundred percent say she was involved. I don't know the name yeah. of all of Teal's therapists, but there we were heavily involved in um, therapy and with being Edith Bowen people and knowing all the faculty at Utah State. Like I did psychological testing up near Edith Bowen. I. Mm -hmm. I mean, it probably was in the psychology department where I went and did testing to figure mm -hmm. out what was going on with me. Yeah. So we were heavily involved with those groups and yeah. being um, a Hyde Park native, the name is so familiar, Yeah, it, but I left yeah. it at such a young age, but it's ringing a bell. I just can't tell you That's what fine. bell it's ringing. <laughs> okay. So Barbara Snow and SRA, like what, 
what do you remember about Teal and that? Anything? So I didn't know Teal when she went to Barbara Snow. That okay. was around the time. What age would what age would she maybe have gone? She says she started seeing her when she was 19. This part of the timeline doesn't add up to me because Teal claims she left Cache Valley at age 19 and never came back. The last time I recall seeing her in Cache Valley was when I was about 18, 19 years old. Which means she would have been 2021. 20, 2021. 20, okay. And I was with my... Well, it's a relationship I don't even want to mention. She met him then. Um, thought it thought he was great, and yeah. So she was in Cash Valley at that time. And so she was. A, you remember her being in Cash Valley later than her claims. Yeah, later than left. her story claims. And then okay, so then let's just back up. Then talk about the deterioration and the ending of your friendship and any final memories you have. Oh, because she she was involved in some things that were very traumatic for you personally and your family, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's one of the biggest things I can relate to with her followers. And when I can talk about repressed memory, um, with a level of empathy, because I've been there and there was a huge focus with her on talking to me about having those traumatic memories that were so traumatic. You didn't even know those memories were there. Um, yeah, the idea is that you can have such horrible <clears throat> things happen to mm -hmm. you at a very young age that you block them out and there's no memory of it. It starts with that idea, which I have to say generally has been summarily discredited by the American Psychological Association. It's rare that people have such horrific memories, even from a young age, that they have no memory of it into adulthood. But yeah. Keep going. yeah. Was she no. saying that to you pre Barbara Snow? Like, yes. Was it an is, idea she already had? This was pre Barbara Snow. Mm -hmm. That's why that's why I have the theory. I suspect that's why they sought out Barbara Snow. Um, but when I was younger and I was really, really struggling, doing really crazy amounts of self harm, I was having I had multiple suicide attempts, um and just a fairly dangerous eating disorder at the time. Um there was the discussion of for you to be acting like this, there had to have been something so horrible, so horrendous that happened to you. You don't even have any idea this happened to you. And that was terrifying to me. I was so scared that I had been abused. I had no idea what it was. And that was so traumatic in itself. Just this, it was distressing. It caused me to spiral even further um, because I had been destroyed by something. I don't even know what happened. And my life was over that. I can't remember this, but I am so dysfunctional, so broken that there's no way I'm going to make it in this life, that it's just the end. It's the end for me. And I tried to reach out to talk to people about this. So she planted this idea in you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. She really, really believed this is what had happened to me. I vaguely recall her parents mentioning it once, but they didn't put put it on me as heavily as, um, as Teal did. I think they were more just like, yeah, this is like a theory that's out there, you know, something worth keeping in the back of your mind. But when I was with Teal privately, it was the, these things happen and just, you won't even know they happen. It's that, that crazy. And it's, you're so traumatized that your brain just shuts down and you can't recall and it starts coming out in different ways. And that's what was happening to me, according to her all the trauma was coming out in the really damaging behaviors. And tell me if I'm wrong, but in addition to it being scary and unsettling, I wonder if when a kid is really troubled and feeling bad that they're troubled, feeling bad that they're not super healthy and normal and feeling bad that maybe even they're causing distress of, of you know people around them, it might even be both troubling and appealing to be told that maybe there's a cause. I don't, I don't want to plant no, that in that, you. That's a hundred percent what it was. Cause I'm like, here's the answer to what's wrong with me. Why else would I be doing these things that I don't understand? And that's really, I'm so glad you brought it up. Cause that's a huge, huge factor in it that there was a sense of relief with it, which is, it may sound weird, but, if, when you're in that dark space and you don't understand and there's, you don't know what to do to make it better yeah. because you don't know what's going on. And once you think you know what's going on, you can start working on it to fix it. Yeah, but, it's so appealing imagining that there's just this one silver bullet that can 
make everything better by f uncovering it, figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah. Not that there's multiple complex issues that need to be worked through along mm. with there, there's just a mental illness there that might need to be treated and so many factors that go into it. But to have one, I mean, it's not a great answer, but a more straightforward answer really is appealing when you're in that dark of a place. One thing that's interesting about this timeline is if this was pre-Barbara Snow, then wouldn't Teal be in the cult at this time when she's telling you, like, you can have memories that you can't recover? When I mean, supposedly she was in the cult. So she's telling she you, so she's telling you, you can have these really traumatic memories that are so bad you can't even remember them, but she's not telling you. And also I'm in this this crazy thing's happening to me. Yeah. So by her account, is she, had she not recovered them yet, but she somehow already believed in the theory of recovered memories? I mean, interesting. she um, talks mm. when, um, I was listening to the Gizmodo podcast again this morning, just to- <laughs> Prep. Yeah, just to get a little <laughs> prep. And she was talking about, she's rare. She's one of the people that didn't have repressed memories. She maybe had one or two memories repressed. But she says she went into Barbara Snow as a really rare case because she knew all her memories. She just hadn't told anyone. Or maybe I mean, she developed them earlier with a different therapist, you know? Yeah, that's where that one's not very clear. I mean, it would be nice if her parents hadn't been mutilated in the media by her that they could come forward and give some clarity on this because they were heavily involved in all her therapy. Really, they would know. This is all giving Joseph Smith making up stories about Native American people when he's nine years old. And then it's like unsurprising that then later he comes up with a fully fledged, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, background of the cult leader or the high demand religion leader helps us understand and fill in pieces, right? Yeah, and like she's workshopping, you know, various forms of lying and manipulation when younger that we now see in her. Like, Coercion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, seeing what what uh, scares people, what what works with people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many parallels. I want to list them all, but I'm. But so, so she's giving you the suggestion and kind of mm -hmm. pushing it. So the, I was so scared that something had happened to me, and I didn't know that I even went down and met with um, our bishop at the time, and. I can understand their confusion now, looking back on it, but when I went to talk to him, I said the lines of, I'm scared I was abused. And they don't, you wouldn't understand the nuances in that of, I'm scared that I've been abused. It's, I'm scared that I've been abused and I don't know I've been abused. So just- And there's someone who, through the power of suggestion, led me to believe I had been abused. That's an important yeah. part of it that you probably wouldn't have said to the bishop, right? And bishops not being <laughs> trained in mental health, yeah. they're not gonna know the nuances in that. So, I mean, that was when um, they reached out to my therapist to say, hey, this girl's saying she's been abused. And it drives me crazy, because I'm like, no, I never said I was abused. I said, I'm scared. I don't know what happened to me. Scared, so with that, I understand now why they were confused about it, but so frustrating at the time. So then it gave even more credit to the crap. She's been abused. We really need to start looking into this. And um, with that kind of coming out and being a known thing to my family, they're like, well, we're gonna get Diana away from this situation. We know she's spiraling with this friend. We're gonna take Diana away from this friend and not have me be there all the time. So I left living at my mom's house full time and went and lived with my dad primarily. Um, and that's kind of when Teal and I started seeing each other a little less. So she would have been 17, 16, 17 at the time. Um, and I mean, it's, it's hard because I know what was going on in that time with me, and then I've gained greater understanding of it later um, and learned about what her actions were behind the scenes. So if I talk about it before I knew what she was doing, um, it's that all of a sudden all these people wanted to interview me and ask me questions about what abuse I'd experienced, and there was um, police involved, and I had no answers for them. 
I, I couldn't think of anything. And I'm really glad they, they didn't do any kind of like leading questions or anything like that. Like there, there was nothing they could come up with. There was nothing I could remember other than the, I'm so scared. Something must've been so traumatic. I don't know what it is. I really was disappointed almost when they didn't find anything. Some, then it almost goes back to the, I'm just broken for no reason. And Mm. so that, that led to an actual, actual, um, investigation, which is horrible to look back on. Um, it caused other people to be questioned about if they were abused also. So it just had this ripple effect that damaged so many lives with just this, this fear. Cause one person, maybe someone was implicated as the potential mm-hmm. abuser. Yeah. So and once that rumor, I mean, what's that association and rumor like child abuse? No, there's there's no coming back from that for a lot of people. And that's why I won't ever name who's been accused because of how serious those implications are. And it's not fair to them. They've already had their life destroyed from that um, personally. And I just want to, you know, you let bygones be bygones for them. No, I don't want to bring up their trauma yeah. with it. But it, it wasn't just me that was traumatized because that put the implication that other people could have been abused. So when I say the ripple effect, it caused other people to question or be questioned about these things. And it's traumatic to be in those interviews and to like sit there racking your brain to look at every little aspect of your life of, was this okay? Was that okay? Were these things normal? Maybe it didn't happen, you know? Yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's really traumatic to, so at 14 years old, I was being interviewed about that. Um, and I horribly spiraled around that time is when I had, um, one of my attempts on my life that was, it would have been successful had I not been found. And it's now it's so crazy to like, look back on what I'm glad you have Kleenexes here. I'm going to lean, um, how I almost didn't make it out of this situation. So it shows you how how damaging those things are and how scary, even though if you don't know anything, just the fear of not knowing or wondering is so horrific, which is why it kills me that that's where her um, therapy stuff is based now. But um, because of how serious the suicide attempt was um, and my physical health declining from the eating disorder, I ended up going into a, a treatment center for um, a good period of time. And that essentially fractioned Teal and I off from each other between the investigation, me being so ill, it started naturally kind of segueing us away from each other on top of just our age difference started showing at that time, like life activities. but. This is really blowing my mind, the parallels to what we saw in the documentary and through the Gizmodo podcast, The Gateway. And you said before, like just what, starting to wonder whether something traumatic could happen to you and like racking your brain for stuff, you felt like you couldn't live anymore, like you couldn't go on, which feels so relevant to like, you know, the biggest accusations against Teal. That you're just so damaged that there's no hope for you. And uh, watching this documentary has been so hard because it's like, it's like going back and you start feeling all those feelings again. And it's just, you have to be so damaged. And then now she comes out as this savior. That's the only one that can fix you, but she's putting this damage on them. That that's not there. And even if these people had real abuse, she's just Nick, negated all of that. They'll never um, have justice or be able to actually process any real abuse they had. She's just ruined that for them by implanting more. I mean, it's, it's so, it's, it's awful what she's doing now. Cause she can, you know, she's not helping you. She's creating the trauma that then she's raising herself up as the cure to, which she doesn't have a cure for, but she's also 
ruining your relationships oftentimes with the people who are your main support system in your life. She's cutting and off the lifeline I, for vulnerable people. From and their support systems. Yeah, so their, she's taking advantage of these vulnerable people, cutting them off from anything that might be a support for them, and she's the only one that can save them. And even when that, that part in episode three, when someone was saying to her, I think there was a couple of people who were like, I kind of do want to reconnect with my family. And she just actively discourages it without knowing anything about their lives. It seems like just her MO is just tell people to cut off your family because that's what she's done. And so everyone has to do it. It's almost like her MO is like, you don't know this, but mm -hmm. you, you were sexually abused by your mom or dad or both. Oh, yes. And they are the problem, and you need to cut yourself off from them and falsely accuse them. And if they don't believe you and agree with this abuse that I manufactured as your guru, then they're evil and cut them off. You know what I mean? Right? Yeah. It was also powerful in that episode when someone was saying, you know, we go to these retreats, and then in, you know, the months in between the retreats, we're just so depressed and like at rock bottom. And it's just like this never ending carousel. And then other people were like, my life hasn't got better. Like, and that woman, Leslie, who, who killed herself, she had recovered these memories through Teal and suddenly she's dead. Like it's, it's such a pattern. It's really, it's wild to hear it happening like during a child, you know, when she's still so young. Um, and it makes sense. Like, yeah. like, like with Joseph Smith, the, Peepstone in the hat with the golden plates makes a lot more sense when you know he was a treasure digger with the peepstone in a hat. Mm -hmm. But Kamala right? makes a lot more sense when you know he was <laughs> coming up with those stories at nine. Yeah, the yeah. yeah, the Native American stories, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, um, it kind of reminds me of back before um, I had the more serious attempt. Um, the first time I had done engaged in self harm, Teal. Um, one of the things she said to me was, you did it wrong. And she's like, if you were trying to kill yourself, you did it in the wrong place. And then demonstrated to me how to do it right, if I were to do it again. Um, mm. And I did that later. And she, at first I thought I had given her these ideas towards suicidal ideation, but she had a fascination with it. There was a lot of talks about if we were to um, commit suicide at the same time, would we be able to reincarnate back together at the same time? And there was talks of having the intention in your mind of what you wanted to reincarnate as. Um, and if we really had that right in our minds and we did it at the same time, theoretically, that we could come back together with whatever we wanted, if we wanted to come back as a horse, as long as we timed everything just right kind of thing, then that's we could have control over our destiny down the road or in our next life. It's, it sounds so bizarre, but it felt so um, plausible at the time. But thankfully... We didn't ever have an attempt together or anything like that, so I just should clarify that. But the but the problem with that is one of the main criticisms of her is that she has a history of characterizing death by suicide as a reboot mm. because because we all have you know multiple lives and can get reincarnated. Suicide doesn't death by suicide doesn't need to be a tragic thing. It's just a way to kind of start over. And so that, you know, that belief in multiple lives uh, paired with suicide takes a really dark spin because it's, it's probably the main most serious criticism of her to date is that that sort of language has, and along with her techniques of having people actively envision their death by suicide which I don't think any mental health professional is going to like nurture to someone who's depressed. And she's described death as the most amazing feeling ever. Yeah. And she specifically, you know, in her SEO and just with all her, like her social media strategy, she's targeting suicidal people. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you're sharing with us the origins kind of of all that. Oh, when I read the story about Leslie Wangsgaard, um, her suicide, I felt sick because it was just the, the talk about this life doesn't matter. You can do your life over, just have a do over. And that's not that I look back and like, had I known she was going to continue this talk? It's one of those things where when I say, I wish I'd spoken up sooner. I could have been the whistleblower for this. And that's where um, I felt responsible for some of these deaths. I know I'm not, but it's still, it feels that way. And so I wasn't going to cry. I was going to be all stoic this whole time. <laughs> It's, it's so heavy. And to have had that influence come into your life as a child and to then like have to carry the burden of that forever. Yeah, just feeling like I was the influence for it for so long. Um, you were her guinea pig. It, it was really crazy to have that realization of all these things that she does now the practicing of it on me, the seeing the reactions from the people around us and how we've all seen it. She's very influential. There wouldn't be this many people following her. Not all of them are this, these mentally broken down people. There's a lot of really smart people oh, yeah. that get involved with her. So it, it shows you she definitely has a level of engagement that people want to be with. Yeah. You were talking about now you know that behind the scenes she was playing a very different role. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that really quick just so to kind of close that story? Um, or do you not want to talk um, about No, that? in like regards to the the repressed memories or the kind of suicidal. And the accusations and, you know. Yeah, so any, any there, of there, there's a little bit more to the accusation story. Um, I never ended up having a specific... Um, abuse scenario that I could talk about, like there wasn't one to talk about. So when I was um, hospitalized, all of a sudden um, there was kind of more questions. It kind of came up again. People were questioning me again. Nothing came out. Well, I later found out um, my mom kind of broke down and told me after everything. Cause I, I had a relapse in my twenties and my mom came forward about this. Um, Teal had written a letter to my, um, my parents like heavily detailing the things that she claimed had happened to me. And my mom said it was so believable. She's like, who would have that level of detail if it didn't happen? And we really just thought you were too ashamed to talk about it. And I didn't know about that till I was in my 20s. So to think that she had really had made up this abuse story about me. Um, and no one knew what she was doing at the time. I think my family members really thought I still wasn't willing to talk about things for a while. There was a really like prodding questions throughout most of my um, teenage years about just pushing, like, are you sure there was nothing you remember? Like, it never went away, the um, the belief that I had been abused. And there's still in the back of my mind the fear of what happened to me. I don't know what happened. It, and then when people would continue questioning me, it still felt like it was happening for so long, just all the, there's something there, even though there's not, that didn't go away for a long, long time. Memory works that way. People can end up believing things literally happened to them when they weren't even at the event that they end up believing they were a part of. Like we know that memory can work this way, that it's a read, it's like a retrieve, write, store, and then retrieve, write, and store. Mm. Memory gets changed and stored over time. And that's just, that's psychology 101. You learn that in your your basic introductory to psychology class that memory just it changes over time. So you could end up believing that's, that's part, part of the many ways that her work is so disturbing 
is that people who aren't trauma victims become trauma victims without actually experiencing the trauma, but then they live as if they are, mm. right? And that was the one difference between my story and hers. I never had a specific trauma put into my mind. It was put into my family members' minds. So I didn't know the exact things. Um, but when she does this to her followers, they're being abused in the sense they haven't been abused and now they believe they are. It's, it's, oh, it's just, as a psychologist, you understand it better than I do, the, the reasoning behind it, but it's, how can you take someone that's in a vulnerable place, make them believe they're abused? In my mind, that's abuse. A hundred percent. I guess. Sure. Well, and even you, even though you didn't recover a memory, I imagine you were still like brainstorming a lot of like potential scenarios that could have, like the thoughts are always there in your mind. You're still like exposing your brain constantly to like images of you being abused almost, even though you know that you're just brainstorming. You look through every aspect of your life and question it, and then you don't know your life anymore. Mm. There's what's real, what's not real. It You lose your life trying to find things that weren't there in your life that you, you kind of kind of die a little inside from it. Um, no, it's, it's a horrendous thing to go through. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I'm sad for Teal if that's what happened to her with Barbara Snow or others. Mm -hmm. So again, not trying to discount the, her potential is an abuse victim, but the person I would say is the most culpable in Teal being abused is Barbara Snow. Like what Barbara Snow did with Teal, I would call abuse to put that on someone to make them think those things happened. I mean, if it was Barbara Snow that implanted everything, I mean, Teal's stories change so much when you go and read through them, it's hard to know what scenario is a real one or what one has changed. It's really, I think that's why it's so hard to research her. It's, it's like a slippery slope on everything. It doesn't make sense. And again, Joseph Smith, right? Like his <laughs> story changes over time and becomes more fantastic over time, right? Yeah. And I feel like this whole situation is just highlighting how important it is, is to have evidence-based approaches to mental health. And yeah. Teal is like the antithesis of that. She's just like, I've got this, I mean, she's, basing it on this thing that was, well, at least where she lived, a part of like mainstream psychology, which is pretty horrifying because like it wasn't evidence backed. And now it's just like disseminating it to the masses with no qualifications. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, we gotta be really careful about how we like allow new treatments to come in with medical professionals, which she's not even. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And by the, I should throw in here a reference to the book, Remembering Satan. Um, it's written by the same author who wrote Going Clear. Mm. Um, oh, Lawrence, maybe someone can, maybe Samantha can look that up really quick. Uh, I'm a little bit rusty on my SRA literature. But in this book, Remembering Satan, it's about, it's a real story about a family in um, Washington State and how a combination of bad therapists and clergy who got caught up in the satanic panic convinced some daughters in a family that their dad, who was a police officer, had ritually sexually abused them. And it became a huge community thing and the police got involved and there were multiple investigations. And, and at the end of it all, it was realized that there was no evidence for any of it, that it was just you know, and also the book, uh, the the podcast is it the Gateway? Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's another fantastic uh, illustration of that, and there's others. So that's what, and, and that's what happened to you, um, and that's what happened to so many people in Utah. Um, I do want to ask one quick f question about that: the fact that she made up a manufactured abuse story with detail and sent that to your parents. Is there any chance? She tried to do recovered memory with you and tried to get you to go back into your memories and even in sort of a creative fiction way, see if you could come up with stories and then 
from that attempt wrote down the account the way she remembered it and then sent it to your family? No, that's a great point to make because with these things, there's elements of truth in them. So there was very much discussing like, we'll look back on this instance or picture um, your parents or this teacher, this leader, and think, is there anything you can recall that they did that would be concerning to you that made you feel uncomfortable? So there were those leading questions where I sat and kind of analyzed things and just even talking about like, like an innocent memory of like the teacher leaned over my desk to look at the paper and she could be like, well, that might be all you're remembering, but there could be more to it. And that's just the part your brain sees as safe for you to remember. So there, there were those leading prodding questions where I discussed elements of my life that were real. Um, that I feel like that's where she twisted some of the real elements of my life and then put her spin on things. And then your mom just had to carry that for years. I, I think if I was a parent and I received that letter, I'd be doing the same thing. I was yeah. so mad at her for so long. So I'm like, how- Deal or your mom? My mom. Oh. I was mad with her because she had that concern that things had happened to me and really kind of talked to therapists about it, wanted therapists to talk to me about it because there was the belief that I was too scared to talk about these things. I was scared of the repercussions of it, so I would never talk about it. It it was definitely traumatizing for her also, just as a parent having that fear. There's something wrong with my child. Something's happened. I can't protect my child. Like as a parent now, it it kills me to think what she would have been going through and I can't fathom being in that position. I really hope never have to be with four kids. Yeah. Because of a child spinning tales. That's what's so crazy is just how much power Teal had over people as a child. Like to disrupt families like that. Yeah. Presumably because she like lived in a time and place where there wasn't the right mental health care for her. So she's just kind of allowed to spin out and <laughs> wreak havoc. It's kind of darkly precocious. Is a, yeah, is I keep a, thinking of the word precocious. <laughs> darkly. I, I do want to just, and, and this is just, uh, we tend to be exhaustive sometimes on Mormon stories, but like the really important element to this is that is that when the therapist or the charlatan convinces the person that they likely were abused, it's always in early, early childhood. It's always like at four or five. You can't say infant. So you, it's always like around four or five. And then um, it's uh, it's with prodding. It's like, this happened. Go follow it, follow it. Mm -hmm. And there's usually some sort of hypnotic state where they're trying to get you to close your eyes or lie down and go back to an early memory, right? And then as soon as you hit, like there's a person in the room or I remember being fishing with my dad or whatever, then it's like, okay, see if you can remember more. And that's where the creative imagination comes in. So there's the retrieval. There's the, had something had been stored. There's the retrieval. There's the implanting of the idea of the abuse. And then there's like, after you've retrieved the memory, now start using your creative imagination. And then the sky's the limit of what you can imagine. And then if the guide or therapist is like, and then what happened? And then what happened? Yes, go with that. That It's real. There's always this reassurance. And we actually have an episode on Mormon Stories of a woman who had a recovered memory therapist, the same one as Martha Beck, Hugh Nibley's daughter. And she tells about her unethical therapist. She does, she talks about these practices. She went through them. But as soon as you've retrieved a memory and then you start invoking your imagination with someone prodding you and encouraging you and insisting that it's real, then your imagination creates the additional memories and then it gets restored as true. And that's where, and then in the documentary, going deep, I'm never going to remember that. Deep the, water, whatever the it is. The deep end. Deep end. <laughs> in the documentary... This is, was the hardest, most bizarre part, is Teal's bringing up audience members, other, other participants in the retreat, to play the dead yeah. mom. Or to play, or no, to assume the consciousness of the dead mother, 
or to assume. And she says, "This is literally your mother. This isn't. You're not just embodying the. Con- this is your. De- this is your mother. That was your mother." She and it's says just some that. random participant who then is using their creative imagination to then engage in a conversation with this guy who's sobbing because he's talking. He thinks he's talking to his dead mom, and then she's just using her imagination to like. It, or in the instance of the troubled girl, right? Who then she has two audience members assume the consciousness of her mom and dad. And then, oh, maybe abuse happened. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, you were sexually abused. What, by your dad? I don't know. And then all of a sudden she's remembering it with the suggestion of other people's content and creativity. And all of a sudden these are when the accusations fly and people are cut off from their support systems and the people who actually maybe love them. And then they become victims and followers of the Teal tribe, right? I haven't found many people in her workshops that aren't coming out with an abuse story. There's yeah. always yeah. an ab- trauma abuse. There's, And it's not your mainstream abuse. Oh, It goes so much more bizarre. There's so many other people that have come out and said, oh, I was in the cult with you. Oh my gosh, I had the same abuse. We sacrificed why- animals. We were buried in a pit. We were kept in an animal cage. We were buried in blood, killing children, throwing children on the top of a fire, right? I mean, it's I mean, it just, how does so many people end up with those same memories? And the FBI investigated this phenomenon, right, and found no evidence. And it it's, Utah you know, had it's like its millions of steel swords being buried in the ground. Like there's going to be evidence for that. Like these stories are not just like I was sexually abused, he said, she said. It's like these things existed, these structures existed, this happened here. Like those things can be corroborated if they're true. Never, the, like never. Like there was the there was the some school, some some nursery or, or yeah, in, like in California. Yeah. What's it called? It was a daycare. Martin's um, daycare. Yeah, like Martin's. there have been so many. Uh, I feel bad that I'm not current on this stuff. It's been a no, few it's, years since in I've the been research you gave me, kind of when I was yeah. reading through things, and it was a daycare, and there was the two daycare people that were accused of doing these horrific things to so many kids, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna Google there it weren't we're any. Talking. Charges brought forward, but. Um, but then they found out they were being asked a bunch of leading questions. And that's what I was going to say with the why these people's stories are corroborating. Um, these therapists are seeing all these things in the media. The therapists are talking. So a lot of the details that they're kind of doing the more leading questions to their clients are coming out. So people's stories are matching up because of those leading questions. It's the McMartin preschool trial, right? Of a McMartin preschool in California, I believe. Manhattan Beach, California, which was one of the centers of, of the SRA panic. Yeah. It's interesting hearing about how, well, apparently there's a number of factors that kind of played into the satanic panic, getting the momentum it did, but a big fear at the time was like women going off to work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Christians co-opting that to say that society is going to hell because women are working and who's going to take care of the kids. And it, it fee Christian, uh, evangelical Christians and and frankly Mormons at the time loved that type of thing Mm -hmm. because then it would discourage women from entering the workplace and it would discourage, you know, allowing your kids to be in daycare. So the religious right loved this stuff and still does. And in fact, while we're at it just this week, there's some news stories in Utah of, of accusations of, of, child ritual abuse reoccurring. And I'm also just going to like throw everything on the pile. This whole Operation Underground <clears throat> Railroad thing that that has been a huge deal coming out of Utah. And now I'm forgetting the guy who leads that. But that was hooked to Trump. Tim and Ballard. What's that? Is it Tim Ballard? Yeah, Tim Ballard, right? Like the children are being sex trafficked everywhere in every place is just like... And then QAnon. Like all of these are just slight you know, slight alternate versions of the satanic ritual abuse, whether it's Obama, you know, and Oprah and Tom Hanks all have a sex abuse ring running out of a, the basement of a, of of a pizza joint in DC. And then when the, when the angry Christian brings his guns to like break the children out of the basement of the pizza gate factory, was it atomic pizza or whatever? (laughs) It turns out there's no basement. (laughs) <laughs> at all you know that was awesome. pizzagate that's that's q on right that fueled a lot of trump's success but then there's also tim ballard with operation underground railroad and the m- tens of millions of dollars he's earned 
claiming that all this ritual abuse is happening with children everywhere and it pulls on the heartstrings. It makes Christians feel like they're doing good. I'll give money to that because I'm saving children. Mm -hmm. And the then perfect these, victim that are always that? completely pure. You know, the victim always needs to be this innocent, you know, like white child in people's minds. Yeah, and they do it they do it overseas where it's unregulated. So they're like breaking into like shacks in Panama or Honduras, you know, and and now we know that many of those operations have been staged or they never really found anything. And they're also the big donors get to come on the raid with them and feel like action heroes. It's so disgusting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For you should put this in the show notes. There's a podcast episode um, by the podcast You're Wrong About. They have an episode on human trafficking. Mind blowing. It's just like packed with all the like evidence and data about what the reality of human trafficking looks like versus the narrative we've all been sold. And it is all interconnected. And like the, there's a reason that the right is like selling human trafficking in a very specific way that doesn't look like how it is playing out because it's advantageous to them. Because again, it's like, Always great to have a cause where there's this like perfect victim and and there's evil in the world and we've mm -hmm. got you know end of times right. Mm. Also, um, oh, I was just gonna say, um, oh man, oh dang, I just had a brain freeze. Anyway, well, I mean, even like Sean Reyes was involved. You know, Tim Ballard would fundraise for Sean Reyes and for Donald Trump. So like, there's this weird religious and political connection. And oh, here's the disclaimer. This is what I was gonna say. Again, yes, there's rape. Yes, there's child sexual abuse. Yes, there's kidnapping of children. Yes, there's even, you know, enslavement and sex trade. Yes, that happens. So we're not, we're not <clears throat> those saying that that stuff doesn't exist. It's just that number one, it happens far less than these types of characters like Tim Ballard and Operation Underground claim it happens. In that way. It's in the, and, it, and it's not in that way. And it's and it's and it's a it's basically fraud the way that these nonprofits are set mm -hmm. up to earn fame and a crap ton of money when you're offering nothing that's actually a realistic solution to the problem. And it delegitimizes actual abuse victims right, again exactly. because it's playing to our fears and it's these are the attention getting words that are going to bring in donations it's going to ruin our our view of what actual abuse looks mm -hmm. like so we're not going to see it because we're going to think it's this what they're putting out right yeah also i feel like things like patriarchy and purity culture play a big role in like perpetuating abuse cycles and like, you know, the more <laughs> I say boring abuse, but I mean like, it's not like a satanic demonic sex, whatever. Like it's most abuse is happening like within family, within families, trusted people, like in patriarchal structures where people don't want to believe that people could have abused kids. It's your boy scout leader. It's your home teacher. It's so your, it's like the people yeah. that will be, um, you know, like we got to raise awareness about human trafficking and like us selling this specific narrative of what that looks like. I, I, I completely in opposition to all the things that would actually help produce. I mean, yeah, there's under so the much very there. noses, there's so much right? There. Under the yeah. very noses. Yeah. Right. Let's go save sex trafficked children in Honduras. Yeah. Where it's glamorous and we can bust a ring and we can sell the rights to join in on the action and flying on a ch it, helicopter with like Rambo style, you know, AK 47s when it's really your home teacher or your boy scout leader. Yeah. Right. And it's like, let's or, fund mental health care or, or <laughs> right. you know, provide actual solutions. Yeah. Anyway, we've totally gone off the track of your story, <laughs> but this is where the whole it's, you were influenced by the SRA thing. So satanic ritual abuse and, and it's, it, it exists. Uh, it's important for us to highlight at some point that it still is affecting people today, whether it's through Teal Swan, Tim Ballard Operation Under, Underground Railroad, uh, you know, QAnon, or the resurgence of claims of satanic ritual abuse in 2022. Like, it's still here. It's so that's scary. why I'm doing this podcast. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it's interesting because I didn't know that's what I had been a part of until a few years ago when I reached out to you because... Um, None of the satanic ritual abuse stuff was something I grew up knowing about. It was when I was 23 and ran into Teal and then. So this is like you had, you had lost touch with her. Yeah, completely lost touch with her. They had moved out of their home there. Um, and I just happened to run into her 
at a park when I had my son with me and she had her son and her new husband with her. And we kind of had a moment of reconnecting that day and everything seemed normal. It was just like talking about our kids and um, kind of like, look at us, we're adults now, we have kids. Isn't that crazy? These two crazy girls, look at where we are in life now. Um, so exchange numbers. Later that night, she texts me, hey, I really wanna be close with you again. I just need to send this information to you so we can be close again. I give her my email address and then I get the email from her. And it was one of the more horrifying moments of my life. Um, and I, I forwarded you the email a long time ago and the, it was, I was just, I was terrified. Didn't know what to do with it. And it was her, when she emailed me, she said, you of anyone have the most right to know about this because you were around it. You were there with me as a child. Um, and it was detailing all the abuse that she talks about now publicly that I was around for the things I would have seen. And as I'm reading through it, I'm like, there was children murdered around us. Um, there was bestiality, necrophilia, um, photograph or pornography. And there's a, another version of her story she tells later on that I was photographed for pornography with her by this satanic cult. Um, they're just the worst of the worst, the things you could hear. So I'm freaking out. I've got this email. And am I involved? Were there children murdered around me? Did these things happen? Were there cult leaders around our home everywhere? Um, what do I do with this? Do I need to call the police? Am I culpable in some way? Like, what is going on? I had that moment where I questioned my memory again. Um, and it was terrifying, most terrifying moment, especially I'm a new mother, I'm getting my life back together after a messy divorce. And then to have that thrown at me, it was just, it put me into such a spiral where I was getting my life together. I was successful in my life at the time. I'd had a good job. I had a son that was my world and then the moment I see her, I get thrown right back into it. But it almost felt worse than before because it was so scary, the things she was sending me. Um, I cut off contact with her that day, blocked her. I moved from Salt Lake two weeks later. I was so scared of running into her again. I went up to Logan, um, blessing and a curse, because I met my husband the same week um, that I went up there. So another thing I can thank Teal for, I guess. But <laughs> Around what year was that? Did you move um, to back to Logan? 2010. Okay. Yeah. And before that incident, had you abandoned the idea of you having these unrecovered memories? Yeah. I I didn't think there was anything there. Um, and after going through treatment and kind of getting a little better, it stopped being as much of a focus when I was doing well. It wasn't brought up. And it just seemed kind of like this weird blip in my life and I didn't think about it. I also didn't want to think about it at all. So I really did everything I could not to talk about it, think about it. So I definitely wanted that gone in my past. So to have it brought back in an even more disturbing way was beyond shocking. Mm. Um, yeah, so I took that that email, um, met, met with a therapist and the moment he looked at it, he said, this is a person that's either sociopath, delusions of grandeur, like listed so many mental illnesses. He's like, none of this can be real. It's not probable in any way. Um, cause I was like, do I need to call the police? I don't want to be, um, have any inclination that I was involved. It was the children being murdered that upset me the most. Um, I just, I shouldn't say the most, everything upset me, but I was the most concerned about that. Cause if someone's emailing me that people were murdered around me, you go to the police. You have to disclose all of that. Um, it, it's so hard to explain that without sitting there 
reading these things and thinking, oh my gosh, my life is ruined again. I'm associated with these things. My life is over. I can't have my life over right now. I have a new baby. Um, I, I can't, I can't just end my life. I can't, I'm responsible for something now where if I didn't have my son, I think that would have been it. Cause I just, it took me all the way back. And my life fell over in that moment where I questioned if I could even, like, what do I do with my son if I'm all of a sudden like arrested because there's these um, allegations that I was there for these things. And I mean, just, these are just my worst fears going through my head and not all of these things are feasible, but it was, it was beyond horrifying. It's still, it's still hard to talk about, but um, you just, you don't know what it's like to be associated with something so horrible until, until you are, which I hope no one ever is. Yeah, so, um, sorry, I'm going to lose my train of thought. So get me back on track, please. Oh, so that's 2010. And, and ironically, I knew of you guys indirectly while I was in Cache Valley, both because I think one of my daughters knew either your husband or your husband's brother. Yeah. But also you guys ended up, um, putting into Logan a art Logan art cinema, which showed like classic movies and stuff. And so I knew you without knowing you, I guess I knew <laughs> of, of your work and some cool stuff that came out of your early marriage during that time. And I'm pretty sure somehow my, my two oldest kids who were into tennis were somehow connected with either your, your dad or your step parents. My younger sisters went to um, high school with some of, your kids. I mean, Cash Valley is such a small world. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing we didn't bump into each other more. Yeah. Sooner, especially. Yeah. But I'm before sure. I knew you, I knew of, of you or and or your husband a little bit during yeah, that I, time. I feel like he was his brother was your kid's teacher. Yeah, um, yeah. My husband was actually a teacher at Edith Bowen when oh, I met oh, him. Okay. Okay. Which, oh, yeah. Full circle. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was. I didn't. I met him right after finding all this out. Hmm. I didn't, I'm really good at kind of tamping things down. Didn't talk to him mm. at all about it um, oh, wow. until after we were married. Mm. And mm -hmm. yeah, so like, positives, like I said, when I saw Teal, caused me to be so fearful of her that left Salt Lake, moved. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out to be a good thing going back to Cache Valley for a little bit which I never would have thought, but, um, but it, it put me back on the, the path of struggling, even though I didn't even know I was struggling at the time with it. Um, yeah. Cause just, she had traumatized you and you had untreated trauma. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I married my husband about a year and a half after that within, um, Three months of us getting married, I had started to struggle with some, I was struggling after um, I got the email from Teal and started relapsing into the eating disorder. Um, and it got so bad to the point where um, three months into our marriage, as I had started going to counseling again, um, my eating disorder got so bad that I almost died. My son came to the hospital to essentially almost like say goodbye to me. Um, and that was after this email that I was still so embarrassed to tell, I didn't tell people about it. It was, I talked to a counselor about it and was just told this is improbable. But that fear still in the back of my mind. Um, I mean, even now, knowing logically those things weren't true, just that the, the damage is done. It's, it's affected 
my entire life since then. So it's it's life altering to be um, associated with that. And now that she's doing it on such a large scale, and people are being hurt, people are dying from the associations with her and her teachings. I didn't like when I um, reached out to you two years ago when you did the ended up doing the interview with Jared. At the time, I was like, if I go back into this, I'll die. I can't, I can't go back into it. It will be the end of me. I hopefully I can kind of give people some of the information on this and they can take care of the story. You're like, hey John, look into this this person named Teal Swan. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yep. okay. You know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I I didn't want to come forward. I didn't want to talk about any of this because I thought I can't survive this again. But it actually turned into the best thing possible because you, John instantly knew what was going on. He, I didn't know the satanic panic was a thing. I had knew nothing about it. Um, and as I talked to John, all of a sudden, it was like this, all the pieces clicked together. It, things made sense for the first time where I just, I couldn't make sense of it and I had the guilt with it and it all of a sudden made sense. I just, I had no idea. I was at the tail end of the satanic panic, that it was a thing in my community. And so, I mean, in a sense, I mean, it was life-changing for me to find all these things out. And then it also felt empowering enough to where I started considering coming out about all these things. I just, the where, where it's at today, I never thought it would get to. And I didn't think I'd ever have to come out. So I'm really grateful that thanks to talking with you a few years ago and doing my own research also since that I feel strong enough to start uh, tackling some of these things and Yeah, I just, I I can't keep staying quiet, even though it's so hard for me to talk publicly. Again, crazy antisocial. I don't like being in front of people. But it's gotten to such a point where I'm putting all my personal um, fears behind me. Like, you can't you can't stay silent when you feel like you have the key that might give people the real insight to what's going on with them. And I've, I've been there, I've survived this, but I also know how deeply damaging it is from experience. And I decided I can't just keep on watching it happen and keep waiting for someone else to fix this problem that Teal's created. You, you just can't stay quiet when you hear how bad it's gotten. Yeah. And I also don't think anyone would blame you if you hadn't wanted to do this. Like, it's so brave. It's so much to, like, unravel and just I can't imagine what the process of, like, processing all of that has been like from something that started at nine, that when you met her at 23 was still able to, like, profoundly affect you. It's just absolutely wild. It, it's and courageous, yeah. So it's, courageous. It's trauma that doesn't go away. So yes, I understand it, um, but it's forever affected the path of my life. And if I go down a rabbit hole and think, what if I hadn't met her when I was younger? Where would my life be now? Would it, I mean, I just, like, would, have I, would I have had a normal life? Like, would have I been able to go to high school and not have to go to like treatment and miss out so much of my life, um, all my relationships um, be compromised. So it's, I understand it, but I, I still grieve what I missed out on and what I'll never get back. Um, that damage is there. It's not something that you just snap your fingers. This is all fake. I not gonna affect me anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Um, 
So I just, I can't fathom that she's openly doing this and these families are losing their children. They're, I mean, these families are losing themselves and all of this and you'll never, you're forever altering the course of someone's life and all the people around them. And it's, it's not this like self help thing that's going to make anyone better. It destroys lives, which is the opposite of what these things are supposed to be doing, which shows you when you have, I mean, I guess this is where I have stronger feelings about Teal. When you have someone that I believe to be a, almost a sociopath in nature, playing mental health, playing spiritual guru with vulnerable people, I mean, you're ruining, you're ruining their lives for your own gain so you can be viewed as something special and unique. You're not trying to help anyone. You're trying to elevate yourself. That's what she's doing. She's elevating herself, really wanting to be viewed as this like deity. And it's, it's, it's just fucked up. It's, yeah, I don't even have words. I can try to explain it. I don't have words for it. Well, in addition to the recovered memory and the false accusations of abuse and the isolating people from family uh, and claiming to speak for dead people and claiming to have special powers and all the lizard alien stuff, like in addition to all the troubling things and the suicide, encouraging suicidal ideation and actual death by suicide, like in addition to all that, two of the most startling moments in the documentary, in addition to the part where they're drowning someone, literally waterboarding someone as a, a form of trauma treatment, right? So like putting all that aside, <laughs> um, like there's this point where this, is it a British guy? Like is mm -hmm. challenging her authority in a, in a retreat setting. She's like, why should anybody be over me? What's your problem with me having no one over me? Like no one, no one is above me. I, is there, are yeah. there better words for that part of it? Do you yeah, remember? I think he asks, you know, is there anyone you look up to and, sh or, you know, that could like challenge your authority. And she's basically like, you wouldn't ask the fastest runner in the world who they look up to, which is also weird. Cause I feel like the fastest run in the world probably could point to people that inspire them. But yeah, right. um, yeah. And she's clearly like triggered in that moment. Like she's not just like, bringing like a calm, serene guru energy. She's very much like, how dare you challenge my authority? And you see that time and time in the, in the documentary. And I feel like in my mind, spiritual teachers that are worth anything, they're like, please challenge my authority. Like by all means, like be your own guru. Don't believe me, trust your own inner voice. Yeah, yeah, she's so triggered by anyone suggesting that like her power isn't as, you know, what she claims. And then the other just jaw dropping moment like at the end of part two where she says she wants to be bigger than the pope yeah <laughs> yeah i know she even tried to explain that one away and say that was taken out of context it's more <laughs> of like my little joke that i want to be as spiritually influential as him but if you know her it's not a joke she doesn't seem very jovial <laughs> like quite melancholy no. as a person no just that that intense stare and the kind of half laugh thing she does mm. um and she's, yeah, joking is not her strong suit. So, <laughs> um, what was the other thing? While you're thinking, Samantha, like, uh, yeah, I like 1.5 million YouTube followers. That's not easy to get. And then you see these events that she's holding, and I'm literally literally stalling for you. You see these events that she's holding. She says she charges five thousand dollars a person for a retreat. Mm -hmm. So like you get 40, 50 people in an event and then she's holding these events where she's filling auditoriums with people that are worshiping her. And I'm like, how is this selling? Like that's, that was also another really troubling thing. And then I'm, I'm on Instagram and my daughter Maya had the same experience and I'm seeing that a ton of my friends follow yeah. her yeah. and like her wisdom and her advice. Because it's easy to hear a soundbite and be like, yeah, that's that, that's true. You know, she taps into some true concepts, 
but yeah. It's like warmed over secular Buddhism, warmed mm-hmm. over new age, mm-hmm. chakra, energy, crystal, spirituality stuff with some reincarnation and some, you know what I mean? Like, What's also wild to me is she's not inspiring as a person because like she doesn't seem particularly happy or, you know, like the Dalai Lama, he's always joking around. Like you can see where people are charmed Eckhart by Tolle's him. Like, ho, ho, yeah, ho, ho, ho. he's got his little German jokes. <laughs> but like with Teal, you're like, do you, I think this is the reason why when, you know, I have TikToks of hers come up and even if there's like, you know, they get me on a line that I might agree with, I'm like, it's, uh, why are people, I, I mean, I guess it's because they're very depressed in a lot of instances, but it, she seems so unappealing as someone to look up to because she just seems so morose. Yeah. Like she doesn't and seem to have a good time. And unstable. Like, like yeah. I, I cannot believe she allowed that camera crew I know. to go behind the scenes and film her for multiple days. And, mm. and, and then I see her reaction to episode two where she's like, they took everything out of context and they used creepy music. And I'm like, they could have been playing like circus music. And <laughs> I would have thought this is evil what you're doing. But she's like, I can't believe they took, they told me it was going to be a hero's journey. And I'm like, well, first of all, you're dumb for believing that a documentary. Crew- uh, don't you have access to the Akashic <laughs> records? Couldn't you have predicted this too? <laughs> Sorry, say it again. Um, she claims to have access to the Akashic records. Every thought that's ever been thought. Oh, right, right. That, Where's yeah. your superpowers then, um, right? <laughs> also, the scene I was thinking of before that I can remember is when there's a woman who's not doing well at the retreat because she's like, every time it's, I'm, I'm still so depressed. This is not making my life better. You've made me have these memories come up and my life still sucks. And then Teal is in just like a fit of rage ranting about like, why can't these people see that I have all the answers? Why can't they do it? And, and then- f- and f- Excuse the swearing, but fuck is like your favorite word. <laughs> yeah. like, He's fucking people. It's not What's like a regular guru. fucking problem. They think yeah. I'm fucking blah, blah, blah. Sorry for the swears, but right? But, like, and when not I that use- swearing's bad per se, but it's it's part of this dark, weird, yeah. unhappy- and then in her case. German convert Juliana says, well, we can't force them, you know, essentially tr- just trying to be like, well, if they're not ready for the message, you know, fair enough. <laughs> and then she's like, well, yeah, we can, or like we have to, or she just can't think outside of like, I have the answers and these people need to, like she wants, she, she says this thing in that episode as well about how I'm immune to becoming a cult because I know what it takes to be a cult. And because I know so much, therefore I would never become because a cult. Because I've been in one, then I know. And I'm I was in one to... for 13 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but like she does want cult like commitment. Like everything she says about the way people should view her is in line with that. She's, you know, she, I think she made one comment like, I'm telling people to follow their own intuition. It's like, how can you say that when you're telling people their own memories that they don't have, or, you know, like telling people things that happened in their life? Not just that, but like when they're reviewing that contract, you have to sign to be in her inner circle. Oh God, it's like yeah. no, fa- you can have no family. Like, like we referenced mm-hmm. earlier in this episode, my mm-hmm. needs drop everything for my needs. Like yeah, she it's doesn't total even put up a commitment. pretense of not being a cult leader. She doesn't even like sugarcoat certain things. No. She's just like, no, do not have personal boundaries. No, and I'm- when, and when what's her name wants to visit her family in Germany, mm. like she's like, no, you can't, it, what was that line? Like you can't have a normal life when you're in can't my- have anything remotely resembling a normal life. When you're in my orbit, mm-hmm. which is more cutting people off from their families. Mm-hmm. And even when you were talking about kind of the incident where she was talking about like these people aren't ready to hear the message when that girl was talking about being suicidal still, she kind of said, is this girl trying to blackmail me with her being suicidal? She's going to come to a teal swan retreat and then she's going to commit suicide and it's going to come back to me. Instantly thinking about her brand. (laughs) Brand. I mean, just for someone that's supposed to be a healer that's helping people, she'll go back and say, if someone committed suicide, it's because they were beyond help. Whether they knew me or not, they were going to commit suicide. No so you can't count that them. against me. And she can't take any responsibility for her part in these things. And it's, the blame goes back on them. Um, she's the victim mm. to all of her victims. And she does like to talk a lot about, like, you have no idea how many people hate me. You have no idea how... And that also just feels classic cult, right? Just constantly reminding everyone we are being so persecuted and that's why you can't have any personal boundaries and I just need to be number one all the time because I'm such a victim and I was in a cult for 13 years. Yeah, it's really, it's, but it's like, it literally, I I think Warren Jeffs, David Koresh, L. Ron Hubbard, like Keith Raniere, um, Joseph Smith, like take, take your pick. 
we're watching a, a death cult unfolding before our eyes. Now, whether it ends in that, I mean, there's already been deaths, but like whether it ends in that, this is that. Mm -hmm. This is that. Even along the lines of other cult leaders that she's talked about, she knows the recipe not to. She's also discussed um, partially to me in the past and then to those closest to her about um, kind of what she sees as the strong points of some of the like serial killers like Ted Bundy and things like that. She's like, they're very misunderstood just because of what <laughs> they did. And what the? this is maybe sounds conspiracy theory-esque, but after my experience with her and being really pushed towards suicide and I'm watching her with these people envisioning your death and all these things. I almost feel like at times she's playing the puppeteer. She's not going to be the one doing the thing. She's holding the strings where you do the things. Yeah. So I, and she said, um, oh, this is so interesting. She said in the podcast, well, first of all, she said, I'm the most complex person in the world. And then she was like, there's a part of me that's this, there's a part of me that's this. And one of the things was, there's a part of me that's a serial killer. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's interesting, because I don't think that's, there's some ways where it's like, we can all relate, but that doesn't seem like a like a universal thing where most humans are like, ah, oh, yes, my shadow side of being a serial killer. But like, that resonates with her, apparently. Yeah, I've never endorsed uh, a, never been tempted. a mass murder in my, <laughs> my personality. Yeah, and and it I think you're onto something. Like if you think about Jim Jones or Heaven's Gate, it ended in mass suicide. Mm -hmm. But what if you could do that without it ending in your death and you being directly linked to the deaths? I, but like you said, you're still pulling the strings. Like it's dark, it's a dark accusation, but it's, like it's a dark accusation. It's not that far fetched. So no. like it so many things around her are unbelievable and extreme and this one feels very very real because I've come out of it before I even started learning about her and I'm like how did I survive this person everything was pushing me to do these things telling me how to do these things and now I'm watching other people I there's almost like excitement enjoyment when I was with her over these dark things and then I'm watching her do these things and really like being excited, kind of relishing and watching these people in distress. It's, it's, it's so disturbing. So I, I feel like she pushes people towards this and then puts the blame on them and she can't take any part of it. I don't think she's doing that much <clears throat> to pull them back from the ledge, even though she says, no, oh, my whole goal is to save people from suicide. It's, it's not. Her whole goal is for people to be damaged enough to need her. And if they don't need her, it's their problem. They get out. And you, as a child, kind of got like the most raw, unfiltered version of her. And she was like, cut your wrists this way to be more effective. Mm -hmm. So she does have it. Like, it, there are some dots that are connected there with her saying there's a part of me that's a serial. You know, I'm not making any grand claims. But like, she clearly is fascinated by the idea of like, death. Like, it's a big fixation for her. And if she as a child was like telling her friends, here's how you could be more effective at killing yourself or like kind of pushing people towards it a little bit. Yeah. It's like she's she's learned that like distress is power. And so if she can create distress in people, she can then harness that power for her own benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like with 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 Joseph Smith, the question or with modern day Mormon prophets, seers, and revelators, the question is, do they really believe it? Or were they conscious frauds? Or then there's the hybrid model of Dan Vogel's kind of pious fraud, where mm -hmm. they, they do believe in the woo, in the superstition, or the magical powers, or in their destiny. But they also realize that sometimes you have to fool people knowingly and intentionally, as because people are dumb and lemmings and they need to be fooled. So like, one of the questions I wanted to make sure we talked about was, could, was is she sincere? Does she believe she has special powers? Is she literally mentally ill and deluded? And she she believes her own press, so to speak. Um, or is she like consciously, knowingly deceiving people and relishing in harming people? And 
I think that latter thing is probably so dark and hard to believe that we don't ever want to put that in anybody. So if we take the first scenario and play with that for, or just mm -hmm. th think about that for just a second, there is a possibility that she, I mean, just like with Joseph, you pick, you pick a domain that is difficult to disprove and is it is an area wh where you can't be fully challenged and suicidality is a real problem like i did i i'm a, i'm literally a psychology phd i didn't know what to do i felt lost we don't necessarily have good treatments for that same with eating disorders mm -hmm. eating disorders are among the most fatal uh, mental illnesses and and psychology would tell you we don't have good treatments for that right now ocd is different Eating disorders are super hard. So like, that's part of her messages. Well, I'm, psychotherapy isn't effective with, with severe suicidality, true. But I, without evidence-based treatments, without any data to support her claims, I have figured this one out and I can solve the problem. Now, maybe she believes that she's figured out suicidality and that she has the answer. So that's one question. But then I can also imagine when she's dealing with people who are suicidal and they're not getting better. Well, blame reversal is one of the 31 techniques of undue influence that Luna Lindsay Corbden and others, Stephen Hassan, cult experts have taught us about where if you get better, it's because I helped you get better or my teachings helped you get better. But if you don't get better, well, it's your fault. You didn't do it right or you are weak or bad or feeble. So I can see when she's playing in such a serious game at such a high level with such high stakes that there would sort of be this, oh, you you let me waterboard you? Okay. Oh, and you st now you had a good experience? Okay, I love you. I love you too. You know, or they whisper to each other, I love you, after this girl's freaking waterboarded. <laughs> but then if she hadn't have complied... Well, then it's like, well, then you deserve death because you just don't want to get better. I'm your cure. You're not listening to me. So you you may as well just like like she Jared says he she said to him, you may as well just kill yourself because you're if you're not going to take the answer, which is me, well, then you may as well just die because that's what you want anyway, right? So pushing, I guess I could see her pushing people off that edge without a desire for them to die. But then if she really does believe in the multiple lives, like you said, then literally suicide isn't literally suicide isn't bad. It's it's not. When um, she right? talked about Leslie's suicide, she did a retreat thing, and there's a video of Teal saying, you know, I lost my first client to suicide, but interesting enough, she reincarnated three days later, and then everyone mm. clapped in the audience. Oh, my gosh. So when I say I think she's pushing people to this, she has thinks of it as a positive, that I'm giving them a reset from this life, but also the dilemma with, this is, she's pushing people to envision their death, kind of talk about suicide. And then those people go off into their life. There's no follow-up. This is unprofessional. There's no clinical trials. You don't know what happened with those people after that. So there's no way to- A, long, a longitudinal study to mm -hmm. see the impact of her quote practices over time. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Yeah. It's so it's, it may sound far-fetched to say she's pushing people towards this. Um, so that's why I, it's not a, I don't want to, well, she is her. pushing people towards it. The question is whether she's wanting them to die, you know, I think like, kind of like what you said, if they're falling in line with what she wants to have happen to them and they're her picture, perfect, I saved them then she'll keep them as a collectible to showcase. Yeah. Exactly. If they're not, and yeah. they're not, she yeah. can't fix them. That person's so damaged. It's probably better for them to reset. And it's, it's, yeah. it's horrible. Yeah. If people don't want me, they should die. I feel like that's a potential schema. I don't know if that's a schema, but you know, like a thing that's there in her brain. Cause like um, her saying to Jared, well then you should just kill yourself. Like that's so reactive. It feels like a reaction to rejection, you know, rather than like a logical thought out, like this is my philosophy. You know, I think it's all just like, She's very reactive to her emotions. She clearly like feels a lot of like dark, intense things. And 
so she's just kind of like moving through life with that combined with her grandiosity and like I don't know I don't see her as being I do think she buys into it fully like yeah but I think she's fine with the collateral damage and is able to you know I don't think I'm not sure if she's someone who doesn't have empathy she seems like she maybe does <laughs> I don't know if it's like a black and white there but it definitely seems like there's situations where she doesn't have empathy where a regular person might you know, and where she's just like, well, if they don't, it's like when people, when she feels rejected by people and anything less than seeing her as ultimate, most enlightened person on the face of the earth is a rejection to her. And she's triggered by that. Like anything less than that is a rejection. Then she's very quickly just like, I don't care. They didn't listen to me. They chose whatever bad happens to them. They deserve it. And even when people come out in opposition to her, um, the big thing I've noticed is they're not spiritual enough. They don't get that. We're different. We understand what's going on because of that and kind of discounts any detractors from it. Um, just with that whole line of they're not as elevated as we are with these things. They can't understand it from our level. And yeah. we see the big picture. They don't. So that staff, we're special. Yeah. She's like, my staff is elite and you can trust them. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Also, I feel like the Teal Swan <laughs> version of like they left the church because they wanted to sin is like they're just mad at me because I didn't respond to their email. And yeah. I'm like, I think it's a bigger problem than that, Teal. Or or it was like, oh, he's just threatened that I have a vagina and I have power. And, and again, I'm a feminist. Like I know men have mistreated <laughs> women forever, forever. But like there's also kind of this feminist empowerment. Mm. But see, of. she knows that too. It goes mm -hmm. back to her manipulation of things of – can't come at me. I'm a woman as a leader. I'm going to use that to, this is why people are attacking me because she knows the power in those statements. And again, me trying to talk about why I think parts of her abuse story aren't real. You can't attack an abuse victim. She also knows the power in that. Yeah. And there's just, she knows. And you can't she, disprove a, a memory that doesn't exist. Like there's this, I, mean, I had this aha moment recently where um, you know, Joseph Smith, he gets the peep stone. Well, no, he, he tells Emma he's got the plates and he hid him in a log. But then word gets around and Emma hears that a bunch of people are going to find the plates, right? What does Joseph do? He says, oh, Emma, just a second. Let me, let me look. And he looks into his stone in his hat and he says, oh, no, they're safe. They're fine. Now, how was he able to do that? <laughs> Why was he able to do that? Because the plates didn't exist. Access to the Akashic Records. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I then mean, later when Martin Harris takes the 116 lost pages, gives them to his wife, and then they're lost, does he look in the stone in the hat to find where the lost 116 pages are? Now they're real. Isn't it that they didn't have enough faith, and so now they're being punished and they don't get those pages back or something like that? This is where I left Mormonism early. Well, that's so. part of the gaslighting, but my point is... The powers are always in the unseen and the undisprovable. Mm -hmm. And for Teal Swan, how do we know some guy named Doc didn't abuse her? You can't disprove some a negative. You can't prove a negative. And that's where all her power is, is in the disproval, undisprovable. It's also an illusion of her power because the level of things she's saying happened, there's, there's proof. There would be proof for those things. So if I were to put it back on her, yeah. Don't just tell your story. Yeah. Show us the proof. It gets extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah. And she has no evidence of that, right? That's where I I don't think she can claim this abuse story no. without the proof and And like like Samantha, you said, she said, without that story, there's no teal swan, right? Even though you can be a perfectly fine spiritual guru with no abuse story, a more regular abuse story. Like it's not necessary, but it is, that's just her thing. Everything's in the extreme. And I feel like there's a path for Teal to be in the field she's in. I mean, growth and acknowledging our limitations and even coming out about what she claims happened. You can say, you can come back from that. Like she doesn't have bad advice. She has some really great moments. It's not all bad. And she's kind of pushing away kind of in the church. We don't talk as much about the Joseph Smith story. There's more of a focus on being Christ-like and mm -hmm. focusing on him. She's really pushed back that abuse story, but it's also the foundation that gave her the platform she's at and the believability. But I mean, I would like to think she could 
come out and be human and say, hey, some things were really far-fetched. Let me set the record straight and set it straight for real. I mean, I feel like that would make her the bigger person in the situation. Like, I feel like she still at this point could make things right if she wanted to. But how would she shed her grandiosity enough at this point? <laughs> That's the thing. I did notice that she, in in that last episode, they showed her saying, whatever memory comes up, don't take it as true or f false. Just kind of, uh, you know, just acknowledge that it's there, accept it. Which I wondered if that was like her walking back on some of her previous approaches because she's now being accused of being the suicide catalyst. And that is, I mean, that it's there's, it's still so problematic, but there is a world where you can say like, you know, it just see what comes up in the psyche and maybe something comes up and it's not that it was literally true, but it does tell you a little something about like the way your psyche works. And so there's maybe something you could dig out of that that'll be valuable. I don't know that she's equipped to really like navigate that either, but like, you know. But the internet makes it hard. It's it's hard to start a cult in the internet age. <laughs> and it was it was a mistake for Joseph Smith to start a church after the advent of the printing press. It's even harder to start a cult in the internet age because everybody's got a cell phone. Everyone can record audio or video, and she's held accountable. So yeah, she's going to walk back the things that are potentially going to get her arrested or blamed for deaths. But then she can always just say stuff in private, which is that double speak where you say certain things in public and then you have these techniques. They're all <clears throat> horrendous techniques uh, that she's now letting film crews film. That's audacious, isn't it? That was shocking yeah. that they let that, that she let that level of her life be seen. Yeah. That's I mean, what makes why, me why think do she you do buys that? into it fully. Yeah. She's like, they're going to be wowed. Yeah. I'm going to be bigger than the Pope after this doc. They'll witness the hero's journey and we're going to be good. Yeah. It is interesting how she is such a modern day cult leader. And yeah, the internet means that more people can expose her, but I, I don't know that it will necessarily like work because the same mechanisms that keep people devoted to cult leaders, regardless of evidence, are still at work with her. And so I feel like that's this she's still always going to have a following that it's like nothing. You can't say anything bad about her. Can I blow your mind, Samantha? I yes, once please. saw Teal Swan at Rotopia. Did you? She eats at Rotopia. I, Rotopia. I know. I know. Oh, I know you've eaten she there. Would. See, that's was, why the algorithm sends me her videos. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went to, I mean, it's my Omar's brother's favorite Rotopia. restaurant. Yeah. Omar, but now it's Rotopia. It's just off like here in holiday. I know she ruined it for me too. I was sad. <laughs> I went in and there was a poster for her new book. No. Okay. And I, I went right back out, but you could door dash it. So I still can get my favorite salads from Omar. Well, I, I, I saw her there and then she like, when she, this is after I'd interviewed her ex boyfriend or whatever, Jared. And then she like left pretty soon after she had bodyguards there. But, uh, I asked the waitress and the waitress was like, oh yeah, she comes in here all the time. Whoa. Does she live in Utah? Mm -hmm. I think that retreat is in Park City. I mean, um, that's what it looks like she, to me. She rents a home in Heber for those retreats. Heber. She lives. She lives in Park City, um, with her her group. Um, Teal tribe. Teal tribe. Yep. I mean, she squad claims goals. Not <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, I said that. Squad goals. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in her mind, yeah, it is squad goals. <laughs> it's squad goals. <laughs> and going back to the people that when you mentioned that the people that live with her. When I saw that third episode of the documentary and just knowing how she reacts to things, I was so scared for the people that are there with her. Um, I even reached out to some of the people that are still in touch with her and there's a real fear that people are almost in danger with how it's going right now, with how she's being exposed to the media. And it's, it's kind of scary to think the people closest to her, pretty much the people that have come out to me that I don't want to name they're they're scared for the people with her right now mm. yeah well in in part three of of the documentary when jared's talking this jared appeared on more stories and on this documentary <laughs> good job jared he talked about her the loyalty test that was the whole jim jones thing was like drink this kool-aid it's poison drink the kool-aid Oh, it wasn't poisoned. Loyalty test. Joseph Smith, bring me your bring me your wife. I'm gonna get married to your wife. Bring the wife. 
and then seal the person to their wife loyalty test, right? She was doing this with Jared. It was like, how do I know you're really loyal? How do I know you're really true? He admits in the documentary that he said to her, I would kill for you. Right? And then the tattoos on his hand. Yeah. The that she had a tattoo it's, that says, is this true on the palm of his hand? Yeah. Because she was drilling him. So, I mean. That was so shocking. Like, yeah, the level of power she has. And she gives people new names as well, right? Classic uh, cult tattoo. I wouldn't be surprised. There's at least um, two people that mentioned it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Jer- Jared's name was Fallon. And he was with her. Um, yeah. One of her other <laughs> husbands came from a cult, the circle of friends or something of friends out in California. He chose a new name, went as Valiant yeah. after meeting her. That's but, classic. That's textbook. But She's like reading the textbook. I know. How does it always happen? <laughs> like she says she knows what it takes to become a cult. So I'm like, look out for your PR. Don't give people new names. That's a bad <laughs> yeah. one. It's a bad look for your brand. Feel swan. And supposedly after um, husband number four is when that list came out of the rules for the people that lived with her closest and husband number four was raised in a cult. Mm. And he's, from what I've been told, he's still, even though they're divorced, thinks of her as a, a deity and worships her. And he's sacrificed his family, his kids, left all of that to go, even though he's not married to her, still worships her and now has his own spiritual practice. Um, so it's just this, this really out there, whatever it is Teal's doing, it breeds more of these. And it's just, it's a never, never ending cycle it seems. So it's, it's kind of disheartening to see you kind of, I don't want to say squish spider cause that sounds morbid. Like you kind of put out one candle and then a, 10 more relight. Like you're just, you're never going to catch up to these. And it's so daunting. You feel so small when you realize how big this is. Mm. Yeah. And that's all my, my final thought with all of this, other than just my gratitude for you and my, yeah, just my appreciation for you and my inspiration at your courage is just like how in 2022 are people like this getting traction? How are people in 2022 getting 1.5 million followers, selling $5,000 retreat tickets and filling auditoriums? Like, where's the, where's the skeptical thinking? Where's the understanding of logical fallacies, of coercion techniques and undue influence and cult techniques? Where's, I mean, how many cult documentaries? The Vow, Going Clear, Wild Wild Country. Like, how many, how many cult documentaries do we have to have on Netflix and Hulu and Amazon before there's kind of cult awareness and critical thinking and skeptical thinking so that people don't get sucked into this. And I'll just be honest, like, you know, when people tell their stories about Mormonism and when people lose their faith in Mormonism, sometimes that creates a vacuum because they no longer have Identity, morality, spirituality, community, meaning, purpose, resolutions about the afterlife. And sometimes that vacuum, ex-Mormons leave Mormonism and freaking go join a cult. And it drives me crazy. Like, did you not learn anything? Well, it's one of the points you made to me um, back in the day that really stood out is these good parts of the church, even these good parts of Teal, they're not exclusive to these organizations. You can have all these good things in your life without swearing your life to these people, without the dangerous side of Teal's things. You can have all these positive things without committing your life to a cult leader and an organized religion. Right. But here's the rub. And I'm just now, I don't mean to make this about me, but there's a bigger problem that I'm trying to highlight. So like uh, back when I was in Cache Valley, we created this organization called Oasis. It's like, oh, secular church, come on Sunday. Samantha, you were a part of that. You helped me found that. You were at the original, like uh, like the uh, Unitarian Universalist meeting that we had pre Yeah, Oasis, I came right? a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, okay. Don't give me too much credit. I didn't help you found it. Okay, so, I knew about that. I had no idea until just now that was you. Yeah, yeah, I started Oasis. <laughs> Small world. With, with, you know, I was in, influenced by others, but we started five Oasis throughout Utah along the Wasatch Front. And they were fine for a while, but then they all died. People want to go, they want brunch, they want to sleep in on Sunday. They don't want new gurus. They don't, they'd rather watch 
binge Netflix than like be sermonized to about how to live a healthier life. Like it's just a non-starter, right? Um, and and so like okay, a week you know a weekly Sunday thing isn't going to work. So Oasis dies. Then years later, it's still I'm having retreats, right? And people are like, I just, I don't have community. I want community. I need community. I'm lonely. I feel alone. I don't have friends. Like, I'm empty. I don't, you know. And so we start Thrive. Um, but it's the same sort of thing. It's just like it's it's really hard and people lose momentum and they're not interested in healing and growth. They want scandal. They want, they want documentaries that are, you know, they want Game of Thrones and they want, you know, like the Kardashians. Like, people don't want... They don't want to be part of a community that's ex- that's intentionally and explicitly dedicated to healing and growth. They don't want it. So, like, like in my mind, I'm like, why take take what take Teal's model, right? And by the way, this is triggering for me because I hold retreats, and I have social media, and I have YouTube channel, and I have TikTok, and I have a a platform, and I'm trying to help people heal and grow. And every, I'm like, whoa, I counsel people sometimes and I've done coaching and, and it's just like, I see how like, and there's way too many similarities to the structure that she's created, but I've thought about like, okay, well, I'll get Margie involved and Samantha and, and really smart people and good people and honest people and non-predators. And we'll try and create a community of healing and growth to fill the vacuum and to fill the need <clears throat> that... Otherwise, people like Teal Swan swoop in to feel, Phil. But, like, people don't want it. People don't want it. Well, like, I don't think they want it. Finding connection and community is, like, a global issue. You know, it's like a society-wide yeah. thing so much bigger than all of us. Yeah. And I think you do more than you know. And I think, like, the more people, um, the more people heal personally, like, actually heal, not Teal Swan heal, and the more they, the better they can relate to themselves, then I think the better they can relate to others and the, the easier it is for them to find community. Though we do live in a world that makes it hard to find community. But I just think like people um, who leave Mormonism might be drawn to another cult because they're primed for psychological dependency on an organization. That's what makes them feel safest. And if you're trying to do an organization that doesn't encourage psychological dependency, it's not going to have the same sexy appeal, you know? Right. But if you can. Those techniques work. That's why I feel like it is all kind of ultimately about personal healing, like through community too. But yeah, maybe something like Oasis doesn't take off that much because it is a bit too healthy and it feels a bit like school. And I don't know, it's like people say that they really enjoyed like the weekly commitment to church, but it's like once you remove the us versus them, remove the fear, remove the spiritual brownie points you think you're getting, like remove all the things that religions like Mormonism actually run on because we know it's not really about the doctrine. It's about like the psychological principles. Sexual shame, fear of hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I think you're, and I think you talking about like the phenomenon of, you know, like we need to be talking about memory and how like memory is not just like this perfectly preserved box that you can just like tap into and heal your trauma. Like Till Swan is teaching. Like I think teaching those kinds of concepts is all helping people heal on a personal level or helping them avoid further trauma I'm just rambling, but like no, I think you're doing great work. I, well, <laughs> I think it's not hopeless. And I'm not. Tr- I'm literally not trying to either make this about me or like turn the direction off your story, but I am trying to talk about the greater context that allows someone like Teal mm-hmm. to thrive. And we do live in an age, weirdly, where prosperity, literally global prosperity, has never been greater. Pick any major indicator of well-being for the human race. Hunger, famine, poverty, illness, whatever. We're better. Like the world is better. Less war, less murder. Doesn't matter the indicator. And there's more anxiety, more depression, more feelings of loneliness, and more suicide than I think that's ever happened before. So there is a real mental health, loneliness, isolate. And I think social media has exacerbated that, Mm -hmm. right? There's a real global mental health problem that is what allows Teal to thrive because there's something we're not doing as a society that um, that that is allowing Teal to swoop in and provide herself as the answer for, right? And like one need that she is fulfilling for people is like, because I mean, tra- trauma, 
violence, sexual abuse of children, that stuff has been going on for ages. Maybe even more as you go back in time, I don't know. But like she's she is giving people a space where they can talk openly about their trauma. And I do think people sharing their stories publicly, like that is that's like a healthy community people can find through social media is listening to other people's stories and relating to them. Okay. So that's, you know, it's like pros and cons of social media, isn't it? Sure. There's good too. Yeah. But, but you see what I'm saying, Diana, mm -hmm. about the bigger problem? Oh, for sure. That we're all really. You were talking about just trying to raise your kids, not LDS. I don't know how to find that connection outside of it. And I miss it. Like I miss having a way to like, find my neighbors to have my kids do activities with um, people in their community. And that's what I really, I felt like Thrive was really pushing towards that when you created Thrive, that that sense of community that we lose from church, we can still have it, but it it's hard. There's not the neon flashing lights. It's like, look how fun and dramatic this is. It's like a reality mm -hmm. show. It's normal, boring, everyday things that we need, but I don't know why we're attracted kind of like a moth to a flame to the dangerous side. I don't know if that says something about human nature. So why the things that are healthy and good for us do we not go to off the bat? And Thrive isn't dead. Like Thrive's still breathing and there's still some Thrive events happening. We just had an amazing one in the UK. We just, you know, I mean, there's still groups meeting, support groups are still a website, and we're still trying to make it go, but it didn't take off like I thought it would. Thrive is surviving. <laughs> Thrive is not thriving, but it's alive. I mean, if you upped the drama, put a few little <laughs> yeah. well, that's the pieces thing, in right? it, maybe. Just saga. <laughs> oh, so, so this is, we're totally off the rails now, but like, <laughs> we're thinking, okay, how do, we how do we stage a big event that a lot of people come to? Oh, get big names. I'll speak. John, you got to speak. I don't want to speak. John, you got to speak because you'll you'll draw people. Well, you're just getting into a cult of personality again yeah, once you <laughs> are getting big. Na it's like Glennon Doyle. Like, how is that different? Like, mm -hmm. it's cult of personality. Well, but yours, then if you don't get big names, no then comes. It, nobody comes because it's like, why would I come to some weird meeting where I don't know any of the people who are speaking? So, like, even that, how do you prevent abuse from happening, right? Or Or cult of personalities from developing it's a I mean it's a kind of damned if you do damned if you mm -hmm. don't like I mean that's it's a big question that's like <laughs> yeah. almost like a universal question because you can look at someone like Teal Swan and see how she actively encourages that whereas like someone like you I mean you're in such a tough spot because your whole thing is like cults right and you know undue influence and not wanting to be that but then also there are going to be people that like put you in on a more of a pedestal than they should, which you hate, which then makes you not want to speak at events. <laughs> yeah. But then it's like, I don't know. I don't know if like not speaking at the events is doing any good. It's just kind of like let the accusations fly and let the content speak for itself. I would Maybe. say the difference is, is anyone being hurt by coming to listen to you? Is there any, anything that's going to hurt anyone? Mm -hmm. No. So it's also maybe I would challenge you. It's not necessarily a bad thing to be well known and to have influence. Mm. It's what do you want to do with that influence? So yeah. I, I feel like there's that. a huge night and day difference between Teal's organization and your organization. <clears throat> so yes, there's parallels, but then there's a huge because there's huge only so split. many ways you can do things, <laughs> and it's like we will have brain DNA from 200,000 years ago exactly. and we're wired to be in these tribes but like the reason to keep the tribe together was like you will die if you get kicked out of the tribe or if this tribe breaks up now we're not we don't I mean it is still a threat to our survival to not have community but it's like it's different and um, also we're all used to like just constant stimulation and like we can get our needs met on an artificial level in so many different ways and our attention spans suck and we're all frying our brains. There's so much going into it. We can get into capitalism. Like <laughs> there's no end to this conversation. <laughs> We've just kind of hit the end of this conversation because we're now we're now we're at kind of democracy. <laughs> now and we're at capitalism. Human nature and capitalism <laughs> and yeah. Well, it's just, it's, it's almost like we need a divine uh, like a, a heavenly father or some sort of like supreme being to send, to speak to a prophet to tell us 
what we all need mm. to follow. <laughs> I mean, it's a dark joke, but like, this is why Joe, this is, this is how churches start. Mm-hmm. This is how cults start with people asking these questions. But they, it takes away our inner power and realizing yeah. we have these things within ourselves. We start thinking we need someone else to yeah. get this and kind of we lose sight of we're very powerful on our own. We have our own strengths. We don't need someone else to do that. Even the dangers with Teal, the church, you need the church to be whole. You yeah. need Teal to fix what's not whole in you. Yeah, We have that in ourselves already and we just need to see that. And I think not have to need other people, but want that connection with them. Not that we need it to be fixed, that we're already, and now I'm starting to sound churchy. We're already <laughs> I think you sound We're already perfect. whole and perfect and complete. Yeah. And I think all the good answers and all the healthy answers are boring and people are attracted to extremes and like, you know, no one wants to like. Or just, magical thinking, right? Yeah, we love magical thinking. We love um, quick fixes. We love magical pills. No one wants to just like sit down and just like be alone with their thoughts for 10 minutes a day, sitting down in a chair. Like a lot of the stuff that I feel like would help us all is just quite boring. And it's like. Yeah. Yeah. But Diana's message is the message to end with, which is that mm. the guru is within you. You have the power within you. You don't need a, a human, a guru an organization, you know, develop inner resilience, inner strength, inner wisdom, inner critical thinking skills, develop inner skepticism and inner power. Get get well, get treatment for your trauma. See a mental health professional who's licensed and uses evidence-based practices and then find good friends and community that support the same healthy values that you have and maybe maybe you'll be okay. You took the words right out of my mouth. Oh, no. So I'm so glad someone <laughs> did because you said it much more eloquently than I ever could. But That's it's awesome. really just going back to the basics and that we don't need to have someone lord over us or tell us what's wrong or what's right. Just we have that intuition. It's yes, it's good to learn some of these things, but we there's so many better ways to learn these things than to have your life destroyed so someone else can come in and save you and put it back together. Yeah. Well, Diana Rivera, what a wonderful interview. It's about three and a half hours. Like, Oh my gosh. I mean, that's short by Mormon story standards, but that's still a substantive, meaty, powerful. And this is one of my favorite interviews of all time. Yeah. I thought this was amazing. I'm amazed. I never could do more than like, I did a two minute talk in church once and I had it done in 30 seconds. And I think that's the last time I remember speaking in front of people. You just broke you your record. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're super smart and articulate and big hearted and uh, courageous Diana. And I'm inspired. And this is like my 1605th interview. So like, <laughs> well, you're, You're very kind. I just really wanted to get the message out that um, just this causing harm to make someone better and that what's going on isn't harmless. It's very, very damaging on a bigger level than people realize. And really something has to be done about this. So I hope me kind of coming out, trying to explain such a complex matter gives people a little bit more of an insight of my, my fear with these things going on so yeah well the documentary is the deep end Mm -hmm. on hulu it's a four-part series you can also check out the gateway right yeah the Uh, gateway podcast podcast the book is uh remembering satan by lawrence wright who is also the author of going clear which is the expose on scientology and um yeah uh, any other resources, you know, watch going, watch wild, wild country, Netflix on Netflix documentary, watch, watch, uh, the vow about Nexium and Keith Raniere. Uh, there's so many good documentaries you can watch. I mean, I guess you could watch under the banner of heaven. Uh, I don't know. Some people like that. Some people don't, but, uh, get educated and, um, don't let Teal Swan wreck your life and please spread the word everybody. Samantha, any final thoughts or things you want to share? No, this has been great. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of this. You made this a way better interview than if you hadn't been here. I'm hoping that 
some Teal Swan followers will listen to this and really get a sense for like the pattern of lying that she's had throughout her life. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. And, uh, I just, I will, I'll shamelessly plug you. Uh, Samantha runs a YouTube channel called Zelf on the Shelf where she and her friend Tanner and sometimes other guests talk about deconstructing Mormonism. And, uh, she deserves to do that because from her perspective, she was recruited into a cult as a teenager and she's not happy about it. So <laughs> she's trying to help now other she's people out for revenge in her, in her own way. <laughs> But also, you occasionally do non-culty life coaching, right? I do do non-culty life coaching, <laughs> and I actually like that as a tagline. You know, very much be your own guru life coaching. Yeah. And I you, don't know shit. <laughs> how do people reach out to you? SamanthaShellyCoaching.com. Okay. All right. So please support Samantha and Zelf on the Shelf. Uh, there's a Patreon. And uh, yeah, and if you're comfortable, if you value this type of programming, this is Mormon Stories Podcast. You can become a monthly donor at mormonstories.org. We're always losing donors, and we're every month, every year, it's like, are we going to be able to continue? So we live on your support. So if you value this type of programming, if you want to see it continue, if you want to pay it forward, you can go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, and we're tax deductible in the U.S. Um, we're transparent in our finances, and 100% of your donations go towards this cause, which is educating people about uh, undue influence and coercion and, and uh, high demand religions and or cults, uh, encouraging informed consent within Mormonism and without, and then supporting people in faith transition, whether they stay in the church, but in a nuanced way or feel like they need to leave, helping them find healing and growth when they're all done. That's what we're all about. Thanks for your support. If you support us and if you want to support us, that'd be great. You can email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, you can also support us by giving us positive reviews on Facebook or on Spotify or on the iTunes app or on Instagram, wherever you can give us positive reviews. And you can like us and subscribe to us and follow us in any of those places as well. That helps with the algorithms. And give us your ideas. Uh, we love your emails or comments. Mormonstories at gmail.com. If you've got other ideas for cool episodes. If you've been a victim of Teal Swan and you want to add to Diana's wonderful story, we'll entertain your suggestions or ideas. So please reach out. We love it. Take care. Be good to each other. Be your own guru. The kingdom of God is within, <laughs> if there's a God at all. And Diana, thanks again. You're you're amazing. Oh, thank you. Any final words? Oh, no, now that I'm on the spot. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just really appreciate you spreading awareness. And I, I hope some people can maybe that have seen themselves in this situation can see there's a path out of it and just not be stuck. That there's, there's a way and there's help. There's actually legitimate ways to get help. Oh, and if people want to email you, how do they email you? Um, so my email is, I forgot... Um, speaking of being on the spot, Diana. it is Diana tells her truth at gmail.com. All right. And we'll make sure and include that in the show notes right. as well. Diana tells her truth at gmail.com. Yes. All right. Thanks, Diana. All right. Thank you. Get, stay well. Keep oh. up the good work. Stay in touch. <laughs> Let's hang out. I will. You too, John. All right. <laughs> You're the longest outdoors. <laughs> All right. We'll see you guys soon. Be good to each other. Take care. <laughs>